after encouraging me to get going, she's telling me to hold on a second. <laughs> convening the uh, Zoom session, which is actually in a ethics training uh, program uh, put on by Clackamas Community College. Uh, anything else I need to say? Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I want to welcome the commission members and our senior staff here this evening. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Robert Bitter here in a second to Clackamas, and he's going to introduce our uh, speaker and our trainer this evening. Um, You'll probably recall about three and a half years ago when I was first retained here as the city manager, we started talking about trying to create an ethical culture in the organization, which it doesn't mean that we didn't have an ethical culture, it just meant that we didn't have a focus on it. And so we started trying to do that. We had our first uh, International City Manager Association sent a trainer out, uh, then we had training that first time, I think that was the first year I was here. And, that, and then we decided that we tried to do that every two years. But in addition to doing the training, I wanted the commission to know that we have also now incorporated ethics questions on uh, in our job interviews for virtually every position in the city. We have an ethics policy that people um, get briefed on when they become new employees and they sign off on that policy, and that's part of our protocol. And um, and then we do this periodic training, and we, we do this training. We don't do it just for the senior staff and the leadership. We also do it for the whole organization. So we've tried to overall create a stronger focus. And, and basically what we want to do is create an ethical culture in our organization. We know that ethics issues are inherently the ones that end careers, embarrass organizations, undermine public trust in what we're trying to do. And everything we do every day requires that we have most public trust we can and I don't think the public ever expects us to be beyond human they know as a group of humans in this organization we are going to make mistakes I think how we deal with them and how we train to try to uh, prevent ethical problems in the first place is the best that we can do to try to keep that trust and maintain it so that's we couldn't do that without the City Commission allowing us and supporting our efforts to create an ethical culture in the organization and all of our employees look to the commission and to the leadership in this organization to kind of set that standard and maintain it. So uh, it's just really important and I want to thank you all for making that commitment um, to an ethical culture. And so now I'm going to introduce Robert Bitter from Clackamas Community College. Robert? Thank you. Very briefly, so I'm Robert Bitter uh, with the college and I work in our customized training department. So our job is to take all the training that uh, businesses and, and organizations need and bring them to you. So we can do everything the college has and more. So in this particular case, you know, we put together this uh, particular training for you today. So I'm not going to spend any more time other than introduce Maggie Alley. So a little bit about Maggie. Uh, she comes to us uh, by an internal recommendation by one of our, our uh, my peers who happens to be studying at Merrill Hurst University where uh, Maggie has been teaching for quite some time in ethics. And so we connected with her and found out that she uh, was able to do this, had done this before, and I'll let her introduce her background. She is a registered nurse, she is a, uh, an attorney, and a lot of other things. So uh, she's a, a quite a broad uh, background, so I think you'll enjoy her very much. So without any further ado, Thank take you. it away, Maggie. So there's probably some things I won't tell you about, but <laughs> so I said to Robert driving down from Clackamas to here for the, the session that it was like a little bit through memory lane because I grew up in Portland, but my parents bought a place in Malala and I moved to Oregon City and I went to Clackamas. It was my, uh, started at the University of Oregon, so any beavers, I'm really sorry. Um, and but went to Clackamas, had two degrees from Clackamas, um, where I received my nursing degree, actually worked at Sierra Vista, which is now Marquee mm -hmm. Nursing Home. And actually, I told Robert my very, very <coughs> first job was at the Cleveland Clinic, which is right you know, behind oh, yes. as a file clerk. Mm -hmm. And I said, I knew I didn't want to continue to do that for the rest of my life. So I continued on, as you can see, <coughs> with my education at Clackamas and I have a, both an undergraduate and a graduate degree in business at Merrill Hurst. I have my law degree and I now um, have a bachelor's in nursing and I'm in my very last class for my master's in nursing right now in fact. So um, perpetual student I guess you could say. So I've been a nurse for almost 40 years and an attorney for 20 years and a biomedical ethicist for about 16 now. So um, just to Claire, I really have no financial relationships. You know, some of the, one of the things that you often face is conflicts of interest. 
I will say though, I do have a family member who is actually with Oregon City. Most or many of you know her as Katie. Riggs is my niece, and so, <laughs> but she had nothing to do with <laughs> my being hired, so, but I have to disclose that, so, and I did get to see Katie just before she went today, so, um, here, there we go, so the program objectives today, we really want to hopefully have this be an interactive session, we want to talk a little bit about the basic ethical concepts, I don't go into a great deal of theory because I want to keep you awake, and moving as we go, um, we want to talk about what it means to be in an ethical organization. What are the elements of really ethical leadership? You know, we've got some great opportunities right now in the media to identify what it means probably not to be an ethical leader and how, what can we learn from those experiences. We want to talk a little bit about ethical decision making and moral reasoning. How do we make decisions that are objective? So often because of who we are, we bring our own values and our own perspectives, but how do you step away from those, still make a decision, particularly when it may impact you personally? And then really talk about what is a good framework for ethical decision? How might we make decisions from that ethical basis? So, you know, what is ethics? I mean, it's one of those kind of almost vague and ambiguous things. Um, you know, it's a science of knowing right relating. How do we relate to one another in a way that we know that it's right? Um, and I really appreciate this from Brother David Steinel Rast, who says, ethics is how we behave when we decide we belong together, when we're going to work together and we're going to collaborate. And what does that mean in that terms of that relationship and the contract we have with one another to interact in, in a way that's productive? And, and we'll, we'll explore that. So you have a very full set of slides. That's really for you to take with you. I'm not going to sit here and read through them. We're going to probably go through some. We'll talk about some cases. But I really wanted to provide you something that would be a toolkit that you could take with you for future reference. So think about ethics. Um, so when you think or when you consider what is ethics, what's the first thing that might come to your mind? And I know you're not all shy, so Kathy. Honesty. Honesty. Okay. Other thoughts around ethics? That's a really good one. Behavior. Behavior. So one's behavior or how they're perceived to behave might be another. Because the public, particularly in public service as elected officials, you might be doing everything right, but your constituents may perceive something different. I think you've probably encountered that. So how do we deal with that, and how do we balance that, Jim? The front page of the Oregonian the test. Front, yeah, the as I call the, which we'll talk about under publicity <laughs> test, is the M and M test. The mom and the media. <laughs> you know, if you're going to do something, could you defend it before your mother, or can you defend it on the front page of the Oregonian, or worse yet, what the front page of the Willamette Week? <laughs> Not that it's worse, but it could creates a little more challenge, I think. So, are there thoughts about ethics? When you think about what ethics is, what it means to you personally? Yes. Um, I don't know why, but I always think it's kind of tricky because it seems like you could be going along thinking you're doing something right, and then it seems more complicated to me sometimes than it needs to be. Like right. Like unintentionally, you could be doing something wrong, right? And maybe that you then maybe that means you're still ethical. Or I don't know, but it does seem like you could get kind of trapped sometimes, in, right? In the positions that we're in. So sometimes I think, and that's a great point. We can be doing something and believe we're headed down the right path, but others have a different opinion. Or sometimes, and we'll talk about that whole concept, which is one of the ethical theories around egoism. We do it because it's about me and I have the power and the ability to do it, but is it really the right thing? It's right for me, but is it right for the community as a whole? And in public service, that's often what the most major thing is, we're acting for the community good, which is utilitarian concept. How do we support the greater good in the greater community? Eric, did you have a comment? Or? I was just kind of along the lines, I was thinking it's kind of a a balance or the, the right mixture between personal morals and society awareness or societal awareness, I think. Great point. And we'll talk a little bit about moral competence and what that means. So particularly in public service, you're constantly in this balancing, Maureen, you brought that up, and Eric, about 
how does the public perceive what's happening? You know, what we're doing, we think we're doing something right, but what is the perception of that greater community and such? So, so we'll talk about that, but it often investigates kind of right and wrong. And as we'll see, ethics when it's... Um, I, I just, I want to make oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's always clear black and white. I just go back to the time when we had a, a porn shop that got established here in Oregon City. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of concern about that. Mm -hmm. The fact is the law doesn't permit you to do anything about that. Right, right. And so, um, so the, your the, concept, the concept of right and wrong, legal or illegal, I mean, they're not... They don't necessarily fit with each other all right. the time. Right, and that's a great point. Just because something's legal doesn't necessarily mean that it's moral or ethical. Yeah. And a lot of people think, well, how could it be legal? It's not ethical. They're really two very different things, so that is a great point. And you know, and if it was black and white, that would be really easy. But so often, as we'll see in a couple minutes in the slides, oftentimes things are gray. It's ambiguous. Or you have to choose between two good things or two bad things. It's almost a choice of evils. And that's even, I think, a more difficult dilemma to be in. So um, we talk about, it asks the fundamental questions around ethics. How should I live my life? What sort of person should I strive to be? What goals and what standards and principles should I live by? And oftentimes in public services, what does the community expect? Because you're constantly, I know, as leaders in public service, you're constantly under scrutiny. So elements really, when you think about public service ethics, it's really to establish that standard of conduct that's expected in the workplace. So as you know, David mentioned, we want to look at how do we create an ethical organization. And we'll talk a little bit about what it means. I mean, employees want to work for an organization where they can feel good about coming to work where they can feel that people are, there's honesty and transparency. We want to determine the appropriate use of power, choices, and personal discretion. I think that can sometimes be a challenge. We want to ensure that decisions focus on the public good, so we talked about what does it mean to have that greater whole for the community, and free of personal bias. Again, we each bring our own perspectives, our own values, and it's hard not to be influenced by those. That's human nature. So how do we as leaders try to not necessarily set those aside, but how do we learn to reconcile our personal bias when we have to make a decision, sometimes a very difficult decision. And it's more about adherence to the law, so Mary, you raised that point, but it's doing what's morally and ethically right. But sometimes, as you say, the law requires that we do certain things that morally and ethically we would do something different mm -hmm. if we could, if our hands weren't tied. And I think that's some of the challenge. So when you think about it, people make moral decisions between right and wrong. We do it every day. Do we stop at that yellow light? Or do we go through that yellow light? So I don't know if you've been following the news in Beaverton. Beaverton City Council is dealing with a major issue at Lombard and Allen because the light is so many seconds shorter there when it's yellow <laughs> than it is in other parts of the town. And so there have been members of the community that have been out there timing the light and they're claiming that the city has done that in order to raise additional funds. So it's really an, an ethical dilemma. Is it just a matter of timing um, or was there really some intent to do that? So we want to do good. Some actions, as we said, it's really pretty easy to decide if it's a good action or a bad action. I think most of us would agree, you know, if you're going to do something right or if you're going to do something wrong. Most of us um, have, I think, that certain level of personal subconscious or consciousness that we're able to do that. Those aren't necessarily the dilemma. I think when you start to get into better dilemma, like I said, it's often really gray. You know, it, well, gosh, is this. And I know batter isn't a word, but it's <laughs> a great word to use here. Uh, it's either better or batter, you know. It's often, it's a much more difficult decision. But oftentimes, where the peril is, is the decisions between two goods and two bads. And that's when, and there's no necessarily a right or wrong answer. 
it really depends. I mean, Eric, I think you mentioned it earlier. It depends on how it's balanced. And sometimes you have to balance what that benefit and what that harm is. And does the benefit, you always want the benefit to outweigh the harm. It's a utilitarian principle of making ethical decisions. So here are some thoughts about what is ethics. It has to do with my feelings that tell me what's right and wrong. It can do with our religious beliefs. It can talk about what is the law. And what are those societal norms? And how do we consider each of those? And sometimes you just don't know. You don't know what the word means because it's so fuzzy and it's uncertain. So it's part of what we want to do is kind of explore what does it mean to be an ethical leader and how do I act in such a way to be that ethical leader? So there's two common sense things. It certainly refers to this kind of well-established standard between what's right and wrong. It's supported by this concept of reason, which is a Kantian uh, principle. And it really talks about the development of one's own ethical standards. To be an ethical leader, you have to be ethical within yourself. To be within an ethical organization, because the organization, of course, is made up of people, you want to make sure that you as a leader are abiding by those own, your own ethical standards. But it's a continuous thought process. You're continuously thinking and questioning and really considering and balancing. There's no easy answer. So moral judgment situations really require that active decision making process. Oftentimes it, it starts with you, but you don't live in isolation. You're influenced by all kinds of different contexts with which you um, function, which with you, with, with which you, in which you act. Sorry. Um, so oftentimes you ask about. So what are your core values? So your community or your organization has core values, but each individual should also have have core values. And so you know, this is actually in personal ethics and organizations, which is one of the classes I teach at Merrillhurst. I have students explore, what are your core values? Some of them have never really thought about. You know, what is it about me that's intrinsic and fundamental? And then some of them say, but I have a core value from when I'm at home, and I have a core value when I'm at work. And I always kind of push back, and I said, well, if it's truly intrinsic to who you are, how can you have two separate sets of core values? Isn't the core value you, because you are part of this greater community, and to have consistency doesn't have to be the same. But the organizations may have core values, and I think that's often an area of potential conflict when, and I've been in that situation and been in organizations whose core values were very different from mine, and had to make decisions around, do I stay employed in an organization where I don't know that I can abide by values that are so different? And I see nodding of heads, so I think probably others have been in similar situations. But again, your values in the context is never in isolation. It's really around how it's influenced by this really overlapping uh, context. So there's some troubled moral, moral questions. Is there value and where is that? But these are the kind of things you ask. And if you think about the decisions you make in your daily work or as members of the commission or as senior leaders, you probably are faced with many of these questions. You know? Is there an absolute? Is there anything that's ever absolute for any of us? So people like to say no lying, no cheating, no murder, right? But are they really absolute? We go to war and people die. We have capital punishment. And we lie. Well, we do tell our kids there's Santa Claus. <laughs> some would say, well, that's a little white lie. Do we cheat? Well, sometimes the weight on our driver's license or our height might be different than it really is. <laughs> so is that cheating a little bit? 
Well, it was, it was that way once upon a time. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I used to be five, four and a half. It might even be. <laughs> or it might even be now. Right, right. So there's typically no absolutes, and that's why it's kind of this continuous questioning process that one has to do to really balance is it, is it a right or wrong situation, and how do we make those decisions. And I think it's important to think about personal interests often drive ethical decisions. You, we are each human. We each have human emotions. We have our own core values. We have our own beliefs. And they can't help but be part of the decision-making process. But the challenge is how do you balance that so that you can make objective decisions? And then also how do you help ensure that you're making decisions not for you as the individual, but for that community good. So why does unethical conduct happen? Hmm. Thoughts? Personal gains. Personal gain, yeah. You believe it's a great way to get ahead? I mean, we have unethical conduct that's been going on in some of the recent communities. Certainly, we've had one in one of our neighboring communities. It's been a number of years ago where there was an embezzlement. Mm -hmm. And part of that was really as what? Self-preservation or potentially greed, but it was focused on them. There was a sense of not getting caught. Robert and I were talking about that, you know. People have relationships with other people. Some work, you know, it used to be even 10 years ago, you could have a relationship with a coworker. Many organizations now forbid that. We've just recently seen what happened in Multnomah County to really an aspiring young politician who now has lost so much credibility in the community. But then the woman that he was involved with also lost a critical position. And it raises a lot of questions about, gosh, it used to be you could have those types of relationships and they'd be relatively private, but is anything ever private anymore? And what does that mean? You also have the case, I mean, the, we say you can't have relatives one over, <laughs> over another. Right. We've often that we've had cases, for example, a few years back where the fire, a person who became the fire chief actually married a person of staff. And so, right. I mean, and what do you do? You're going to fire one because of that? Right. And a lot of companies would say, yes, they'd have to get reassigned because you can't have from a conflict of interest, you really can't have someone that you have a personal relationship immediately after you. But in which case, they may not have the experience to take another job outside the department they work in. Well, right. So how do you balance that within the organization? And I think one of the other challenges is, as elected officials, you have a certain level of implicit power or authority. And should you ever be a reference for someone who's looking to be hired within your city government. I don't have the answer to this. That's the thing about the ethicist. We can ask all the questions. <laughs> um, but it raises an interesting question. Does your power and authority carry so much weight that it could influence a decision and um, not necessarily based on the person's qualifications, but simply because of who they're, who's referring them? And I think, you know, could that have been, and that was part of the concern on the Multnomah County, was this young woman, because he served as a reference, could he really be objective because he had had a personal relationship? And I think those are the kind of things. So it's conflict of interest that was unreported. That wasn't known that they'd had a personal relationship. And, um, and sometimes the cost to do the right thing might be too high from a personal perspective. We had a case where we had a... The city staff was convinced, actually, that a person working on a sewer drainage pipe or mm -hmm. a company had left a 4x4 in there, caused a backup into the, into the property. It made the property unlivable. Uh, but I think the staff felt that, that we should somehow do something, but the insurance company got into it. I mean, it was the insurance company saying they got into it. It became highly litigious. The, People paid a lot more to the attorney than they probably should be, and I, I always felt it was a lose-lose situation. Right. But, right. It's, but it couldn't, you know, our insurance company said, well, we're going to take this course of action, period. Right. 
and they were yeah. hell bent, if you will. Yeah. That that was kind of those <coughs> lines they drew, and sometimes we draw lines, and you lose your flexibility, <coughs> as opposed to being able to be more collaborative and working through conflict. That's a whole other topic, but working through conflict in that more collaborative and non-polarized uh, approach and such. So, and you raise another really good point. Sometimes we make decisions and how far should we look at those consequences? Is it the short-term consequences or is it the long-term consequences? So utilitarians say, you know, there's this balancing of benefit and harm. Well, is it the immediate benefit and harm or is it down the road you know, if you think about what happened to Ford Motor Company, um, just to use an example, you know, they, some of you are old enough to have, remember the Pinto cars? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, you could hit the back of a Pinto, it could, put, could potentially explode, didn't always, but could potentially explode, and it was an $8 uh, fix. But there were millions of those cars out there, hundreds of thousands of those cars out there, so it was a huge dollar figure that Ford would have had to pay and Ford balanced well a few people would die for this cost and they chose not to fix it but it had the long-term consequences really to affect the reputation so how do you balance that and that's part of that decision-making process that hopefully we'll, we can talk more about so ethics really requires asking what do we do So from a personal perspective, and am, I, am I acting in my interest and everyone else can do what they want? Or should everyone act in their own self-interest? Another term would probably be chaos, right? Or everyone should act in his or her self-interest. And so it doesn't really matter. But the bigger question is, how do we act and how do we ensure that we're looking at the greater good. And it really raises an interesting point about motivation and how to reconcile that. So this is a schematic, if you think about egoism as an ethical concept that's based on making a decision not necessarily with the greater community in mind, but really an eye-centered decision. So some people are high egoism, means that they're very focused on themselves. Low egoism, they tend to be more focused on the community. And then you look at this high altruism, which is you know, making sacrifice to low altruism. I br bring this in because of kind of where people are as individuals and how we tend to respond and act around these kind of ethical questions. That ideal state is having self-interest for others you're highly altruistic and I think those in community service tend to be and though and have you have a certain level of egoism because you have to in order to be willing to step up and stand up for others to be an advocate and but you can see when you have lower altruism and high egoism well you act in a, at the expense of others and so this is just kind of to give you an idea of kind of if you think about just yourself, and I won't have you do it, but often with students I'll ask them, where do you put yourself on the scale? If you had to think, gosh, how do I personally act in my daily life, and how I respond, what box would I be in? We'd all strive to be in the ideal box, but sometimes when we're true to ourselves, that may not be where we always find ourselves. And that's part of that challenge. So dilemmas, again, are really the tough choices, typically pitting one right against another. Sometimes it can be that choice of evils, pitting the wrongs against each other. So think about some really tough ethical choices. I know that's kind of small, but um, So if you think about some of your own decisions that you have to make, do you, ref I'm trying to think there was one, do you extend equal social services to everyone regardless of race or ethnic origin, 
or do you pay special attention to those cultural backgrounds who may have been denied opportunities? So the disenfranchised. So if we think about health plans, health coverage, do we differentiate who receives? We do. Oregon Health Plan is a system that's primarily geared at what? Providing care for women. One of the largest groups of uninsured is younger age men, because none is a system. WIC doesn't cover them, and technically OHP won't cover them. So you find a lot of younger age men without insurance, particularly if they have no employment. Because, and they're, they're but you don't hear it talked about much. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be interesting, I think, as we see you know, the new health exchange come out and what the availability of coverage is going to be. But this raises kind of some interesting um, kind of juxtapositions, if you will, about making tough choices. Do you find out all you can about your competitors' costs and their price structure, or do you only obtain information through proper channels? So the right thing is to obtain the information through proper channels, but if you're really competitive, you want to win, right? So you're, some people would say, well, I have to get all the information I can. And if I can get it, and right now everything's relatively available on the internet, it, it raises kind of that dilemma. Is it the competition in my winning, or is it doing it the right way? And I think those are some of the challenges. Certainly in Oregon, we've dealt with that very top bullet. Is it about the forests, or is it about protection of our owls? We're now no longer really as endangered as they were, but how, what little logging do we do now? And really it's loggers who are still out there who really have very little financial capability now because of um, the changes. And that's not to be judgmental, that's just to say, you can see that there's some interesting juxtapositions. Or um, do we bench the college uh, quarterback caught drinking the night before the championship game, or do we field the best possible team? So we saw this happen at the University of Oregon. Right? One of Mike Bellotti's star players got benched for part of the season and then he let him play. And when it came to that big game. And there was a lot of concern of, are you true to yourself and staying by your belief that you're gonna act this way? And what did it say to this young man who knew he had done wrong? Or you wanna believe he had done wrong? So those are kind of some of the tough ethical choices. So when we think about conflicts and conflict resolution, those four outside boxes, we can typically address. It's when we get to that center section on values that's often the most challenging. Because we each bring our own values and we often it's the least capable of resolution. My values may be very different from the mayor's, but his I have to honor and respect. Just like I would expect him to honor and respect mine. He may not agree with them, and so when you're in a conflict situation, it can be really challenging because our tendency in conflict is what? Is to get polarized. Is to get, you know, as you said, we draw this fine line. The insurance company wanted to make sure that we weren't crossing over and we were going to take this to full litigation, even though litigation may not have been the best answer and spent probably way more money than needed to be spent. So oftentimes, if we think about ethical issues, we look at this, um, you know, so it's, as I said earlier, it's not about right or wrong. It's oftentimes it's right versus right. So truth versus loyalty. So as people that are in either elected positions or in senior leadership positions, you may know something about a decision that's going to be made that may affect your neighbor. But given your position, you know, can you tell your neighbor about that? Do you have that loyalty? Is your loyalty to your job, to your position, or is your loyalty to those that you have a close personal relationship with? Is it about the individual or the community? So we talked about that earlier, is that this egoism, 
about it's about me or is it about this greater community? The short and ter long term consequences and this whole concept of justice versus mercy. People make mistakes. And do you demonstrate them mercy or do you take that fine line? So I had an employee a um, number of years ago now who, um, bright young man, who um, was caught with pornography on his screen. Absolute termination required offense. It, but at the discretion of the manager. And so we sat down, and he was terribly embarrassed because, you know, I'm a female manager for him. And, um, and he was found because he walked away from his computer and one of the female employees saw it. He was using the company's computer. That's right. And that was really a key piece. Yeah. So technically, he was on work time. He was using the company's computer. I mean, and he had pornography on the screen. I mean, three things. That, but we looked at justice versus mercy. So justice would say what? He's fired. Mm -hmm. And everything would support him firing. It was a union environment. So, you know, I had to meet with the shop steward and talk through what had happened. Shop steward agreed. But I really felt that this young man was in trouble. There was... He had no bad behaviors. He'd been with the company for years. And I just sat him down and said, you know, it's kind of like, it reminds me of um, Jay Leno when he sat down with, why can't I think of that actor's name? Hugh, Hugh Grant. Grant. Hugh Grant. And he said to him, what were you thinking? And I said this to this young man, I said, what were you thinking? You're at work. A young, young female employee saw this. Devastated. I mean, this was so foreign to her. And um, and he, you know, broke down in tears and he shared with me what had happened in his home life and what was happening. And I made the decision, gave him I gave him a last chance agreement. We changed the position of his computer, he agreed to go to EAP. We put some very specific things in place. But you're absolutely right. From a justice perspective, I had every reason to let him go. From a mercy perspective, he had been a great employee and was in trouble. And he admitted he was in trouble because of stuff that was happening in his home life. And from a mercy perspective, from an ethical perspective, I made the decision to keep him on. Um, yes, John. So all the bullets up there make sense to me, except for truth versus loyalty. That loyalty piece seems to me to be a good way to get into trouble. Truth seems like would always prevail over loyalty. I'll tell you. Though. So, so can That's you ex really can you explain to me what you're thinking? Uh, the other one's all balanced: individual, community, short-term, yeah. long-term, justice, mercy. But truth and loyalty. Did you want to say something? Well, we had a person that was responsible for <coughs> for Tri City Sewer Complex an engineer. He was before the, their county commission. He answered a question truthfully to the commission. And the administrator fired him. Because he wasn't being... He was being truthful. He was being truthful, but he wasn't being loyal. Right. Well, that's see, that, who made the ethical problem there? Was it yeah, the that's administrator right. that that's fired right. him? Or, yeah. So I'm still trying to figure out loyalty. Uh, loyalty is important, I get that. But, right. um, but if it came to truth versus loyalty... Um, right, but some you? people would believe that they should be loyal. So that's a great example where his boss felt the loyalty should prevail over telling the truth. Now, who created the ethical dilemma? Right. That's, mm -hmm. that's the, the fellow who was testifying was being true to his own truth, right? And by telling the truth, and that's what you would expect. But here, his employer said, you were being disloyal to me, and it was grounds for truth. One could argue that, boy, that's not the right path to be on. But we've seen that. And I think that's sometimes a challenge that loyalty, for some, outweighs being truthful. Well, and you've got that, and of course, going on in terms of the, in terms of the uh, on the power administration where whistleblowers are apparently fired, but you've got laws that are supposed to protect right. whistleblowers. Right, yeah. 
And actually in the frontline session, we're going to talk a bit about whistleblowing because just because laws exist for whistleblowing yeah, doesn't mean that there aren't ways that individuals find themselves without a position. And they typically, an employer often will say, well, it's not for the reasons, it's for another reason, mm -hmm. we're doing a restructure. Mm -hmm. And your position no longer exists. But was that considered? And that's where you know you get in some of the litigation and the challenge of that. But you know, unfortunately, some employers have found their way around some of those whistleblower um, protections. Such, so. so when we think about ethical problem solving, so we've already talked about it's that weighing of the benefits and harms looking at what are those consequences, sometimes looking at the short term versus the long term. Um, what are the moral rights? And I mean, so John, you raised a good point. That individual in the mayor's example was doing the right thing by telling the truth. Morally, he could live with himself because that was more important to him than just being loyal. Whereas his employer felt the right thing for him to do was loyalty above the truth. Because that loyalty meant more. And that's a value determination. There was a good example of that in a movie. Yes. When Tom Cruise says, all I want is the truth. Right. In a Marine Corps. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can't handle the Be truth. Be good men, wasn't that the... <laughs> yeah. 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 And then he said, you yeah. can't handle And finally truth. they got to the truth. Yeah. There was a code red. Right, right. So that's a great example, actually. And we do see that in some employment. So oftentimes, um, and I think, you know, John, it goes to part of your point, is this whole concept of the integrity index. You know, so as public servants, and by, by that I mean the fact that you are in public offices, either because you work for the city or because you're in an elected position, there's oftentimes a bright line between right and wrong. But sometimes it can be a little blurry. It's that gray area we talked about earlier, and it's often influenced by values and perspectives. It's important to understand where your biases are. And how do I reconcile? How do I either disclose that I have a bias, or how do I come to terms with that bias that either I recuse myself and or I'm able to set it aside to be objective? And others judge where the bright line falls. So you may believe that you're here, but how you're perceived is it's influenced by how you act or how others see you act. And I think, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So it gets to this whole on concept of integrity. So Kathy, you brought up one of the key elements of ethics is this concept of honesty. So with honesty, oftentimes you see integrity. Um, it really is this concept that we speak of, but do we really know what integrity is? And as you'll see in the next slide, it's oftentimes we know what integrity is when it's not there, when it's missing. So um, is it what you believe? <laughs> Or is it how you believe it? Is it telling the truth or being true to the truth that you tell? So I go back, Mayor, to your example. The fellow who testified was telling the truth and was being true to what he felt he needed to, even though he may have known that he would lose his job. And sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, we find ourselves in some employment situations where our our values and that of our employer in, are in conflict. And we know they're in conflict, and sometimes we have to just step away from that situation. Um, is it being morally upstanding, or is it standing up for the same personal morality no matter what the context? So is it having that, this is the only way I'm going to think about this issue? Or is it being willing to say, Sometimes that issue may differ depending on the context. And again, we don't necessarily have a right or wrong answer, but I think it's asking those really important questions. 
So really, building public trust requires integrity, and it's really at the foundation of what we do. It has everything to do by our behavior and our actions. It's what people perceive and what people see. It's what they witness. It's acting according to shared values. So one of the things David said is having this culture of ethics. And having an organizational, you can say you have an ethical organization, but if it's not practiced, and if people don't see it, they probably don't believe it. So it has to do, and we'll talk about that, it has to do with transparency. It has to do with demonstrating integrity. And how you act influences how you lead. So again, integrity is often determined by what's missing. So I think, you know, you'll meet someone, I think we've all had that experience, where you just don't feel comfortable with that person. You get that gut sense and like something's missing. They're, you don't find them to be either truthful or honest with you. And it's oftentimes because what's missing is that sense of integrity about that individual. So there's certain characteristics that I think are important. So we talk about integrity. We talk about maturity. Being able to express commitments with courage so when you serve in your elected positions, there's a fair amount of moral courage. And we'll talk about moral competence and moral courage. And then there's this abundance mentality. It's being able to see the possibilities. And I think if you think about an ethical organization, you see each of these. You see a higher level of engagement because people are able to see Pop, the positive growth potential. They're able to exchange ideas without fear. And, um, you know, the next couple days and then next week we'll be meeting with managers in Frontline and they actually have a certain different variation of this same talk, more focused on what are the issues around management and what are the issues for Frontline. But part of it we talk, talk about is how do they engage in the process within an ethical organization. So ensuring integrity is some building blocks are honesty, dependability, fairness, and accountability. And it's having that at all levels of the organization. So this is just one of my favorite, I know this is from an old book, but it's one of my favorite quotes from Covey that talks about real leadership power comes from having an honorable character. Being able to stand by what you believe in and your principles and really demonstrating those. And oftentimes, that last part, a more fruitful approach is often to look at followers rather than leaders to assess leadership by asking, why do the followers follow? So you know, one of the key um, theories around leadership right now is around transformational leadership. And part of that is because you have this engagement that's so different from older theories of leadership, where you actually have the leader engaging as opposed to being more top-down, autocratic. So if you think about his power process, there's different leadership approaches. So you can have this principle-centered power, which is more transformational, and it's around honor and sustain proactiveness and influence. You can have utility and fairness. So that's kind of the middle of the road. But you can have, you know, and again, go back to your example, Mayor, um, coercive power. You can have leaders that lead by power and fear. And it's temporary and reactive. And followers don't follow in that situation. Mm -hmm. That is, won't result in an organizational culture that's ethical. You really need to be to this far side where people feel engaged and they see the transparency of leadership. And again, I'm not going to go all through this, but this kind of gives you <coughs> kind of that separated, this four levels of what you want to see around shared visions and principles, strategies, and you'll have more alignment in terms of, and this is again Covey's paradigm. 
So if we think about institutionalizing ethics within an organization, it's really acknowledging the importance of the necessity of conducting business. So one of the things we'll talk about um, the second part tonight is how do we make ethical decisions and what is a decision-making tool for that? We'll get into the publicity test, Jim. We're doing that. Um, you want to make an effort to encourage um, your people to take moral responsibility seriously. To be able to, you know, even have the exercise with them about what are their core values and how do those reconcile with the organization. Um, you want to end the defensiveness in the face of public discussion and criticism and solicit public opinion. So I go back to the BP event in the Gulf. You can remember the very first person from BP that came out and what did he do? I mean, their, their PIO, was, uh, public information officer, was quite concerned because his first comment was very defensive. And they had to do a lot of backpedaling to get that you know, corrected. So how do you admit, take accountability, admit when we've made a mistake? And that's part of that ethical um, um, position, I guess you would say. And you have to recognize the pluralistic nature of the social system. People are diverse and yet interlinking. So within your own communities, you're going to see differences of opinion and how do you reconcile that? One of the things that you might run into you're talking about a catastrophe that was man-made. You, you may not know exactly what caused it, and so you want time to analyze it, but you're not really given the chance to do so. I mean, the demand for right. answers is immediate. Right. I mean, we can think about Katrina and FEMA's response. I mean, we were talking just before the, um, turns out Kathy and I crossed paths in our past lives, and um, I was involved in emergency preparedness with, when I was at Providence. And the preparation, or the lack of preparation within the whole community of Portland and the Portland metropolitan area for a true disaster. And even though we have drills, what are our public buildings and are we really ready? And how do we, you know, those aren't <coughs> man-made disasters, those are acts of nature, but do we have the ability to respond to those in such a way? You know, and how do we prepare for them? And I think acknowledging the importance and then taking more responsibility that these things will happen, how do we prepare ourselves? If you can think about it, and we'll talk more about just ethical decisions. So um, one of the things about if you think about employees within any larger corporation, if you think about, uh, this came out, and it's a little older survey, but the information I think was still good is nearly one third of employees say their coworkers condone unethical practices at work. And the types of misconduct that were most often observed were abusive and intimidating behavior. 21% of the time it was that demonstrated. Misreporting of hours worked, lying, or withholding needed information. Those are really high numbers if you think about a workplace. And how do you break through that to correct it? So, um, and I don't know if we've ever done a survey locally. I mean, this was a big national survey that was done, but it raises some really interesting questions. This was also from that same article. Employees in transitioning organizations, so those that are going through mergers or acquisitions, could be a restructuring of departments or divisions, observe misconduct and feel pressure at rates that are nearly double those in a more stable environment. So as an employer, having stability within your organization is really important because you, know, you have the potential to really have higher rates of misconduct when there's instability. Kathy? Oh, I remember back in our previous life, <laughs> our uh, previous there life. was a president between Robert Polari and Dr. Mm -hmm. Brown. Dr. Uh, Delmonico. Yeah. And he came and went very quickly. Right. And that destabilized and really demoralized a huge percentage of the right. employees. And they were doing employee surveys at the time, and things just went right, right, right. With, with, because there was something perceived in that person, even though he was you know, top of the organization, 
that wasn't quite right. Right. And what was really interesting about that is he was also not seen. Uh -huh. He so rarely was seen by front line mm -hmm. that there was a lot of unknown. There was a lack of transparency is what you heard most often from employees. This is from one of the larger health systems in Portland. But it really goes to this whole idea of the instability of leadership mm -hmm. and how that can affect frontline employees. So you being strong ethical leaders helps employees see you as role models. So your, and we'll talk about moral competence in a minute, being able to demonstrate that has a positive influence, and as you said, in valuing employees versus devaluing. Mm -hmm and feeling more secure in their work. And I think this last bullet's interesting. It says, despite an overall increase in reporting misconduct, nearly half, if you'll read that, so 44% of employees still did not report misconduct. Primarily out of a belief that nobody would do anything, because that had been the pattern in the past. And they didn't think the report would be kept confidential. And it was out of fear. So how do you help create an environment where that doesn't exist? So doing the right thing in business matters. I think you probably see that in your own organizations and certainly within the city. Um, you save money, so Mayor, here you go. Billions of dollars on lawsuits and litigation. You know, if you look at nationally what's spent on that. Um, settlements and theft. And I think it's interesting, this is, came from this uh, article called The Cheating Culture. It's estimated that theft costs companies $600 billion um, and that 79% per of workers in this um, survey admitted to thinking about stealing from their employers. 79%, that's a lot. And it could be stealing, and if we think about it, so we were talking about use of the internet, you know. It could be use of the internet, use of fax, making what used to be making long distance phone calls. Um, it'd be taking home materials. So I remember a student once who um, shared with this example, um, former colleague of theirs was um, eliminated from their job and wasn't going to get all their vacation pay the employer had decided to cap a vacation pay, and so they were going to be out about $2,000. So that employee decided, huh, I've got the laptop. They don't know that I have the laptop. I'm just going to keep the laptop. That's about $2,000. <laughs> now, they felt they were completely in the right because they felt the employer owed that to them. Now, from a moral and ethical position, they weren't, it, it was kind of, it was very interesting, particularly with the organization this individual was with, but the employer didn't know any different because he hadn't, they hadn't tracked this. And yet this employee felt that he was owed that. And if he wasn't going to get it in cash, he was going to take it in property. Mm -hmm. So he fell into that 79% who admit that they've, they've taken something from the employer. So what are the other costs? So, you know, Kathy, you mentioned the one about devaluing. You have deterioration of relationships, damage to reputation, declining employee productivity and loyalty, ineffective information flow, and increased absenteeism. So ensuring you have an ethical organization brings people up, employees will feel more engaged, and you t will see lowering of these aspects. And I think that's, you know, as we talk about, David, I appreciate you mentioning that earlier in terms of how do you make sure we have an ethical organization where people want to come to work, they want to be proud of where they work, and how do we accomplish that? <coughs> so what does ethics provide? And it really provides those principles and guidelines to assist people in making informed choices about the right thing to do. Jim? Maggie, I just want to bounce back to the uh, you know, slide you had for the... Um, Which one? Oh, about the fear, uh, the employees... One uh, went ahead of that. About f employees having fear of... Uh, this report, one? Exactly. Uh, report not being kept confidential because you're going to be talking to the managers and the staff. And honestly, there's no way we can keep 
that confidential. There's, when someone reports something we, right. in a public sector organization, it's not going to remain confidential. We ask that you try to keep it confidential, but it, there's no guarantees. Right. Uh, and that's usually how we preface it. So you know, there's, no, there's no guarantee that anything that's reported will be kept confidential. Right. And I think that's a really important point because regardless of your organization, you know, when an employee comes to you and says, I'm only telling you, you can't tell anyone else. And as a manager, you know, particularly I think about a sexual harassment situation, you have to take immediate corrective action, which means you're going to have to talk to someone else. And sometimes, so it's really helping employees understand that in order for me to act as a manager on this, I have to be able to have the conversation with others. But that's a really important point. And again, that was that study where people were afraid of what would happen with their and yet, you have to be able to. And I think, particularly as a public entity, you know, in the city, you probably have even, well, I know you do. You have higher um, uh, release of personal information, not personal information, but public information. Yeah. Well, if it's a criminal act. <coughs> well, if it's a criminal act of theft, you know, like the example I gave you with the, the laptop, the employer absolutely could have pressed criminal charges there because that was such a blatant theft. Are uh, they required to turn it over to the yeah. city, city attorney or district attorney? Right. Well, you're required to, we, you know, we would, I mean, I had to deal with this, not the same situation, but similar. And we actually called in the court, this was when I was in court, we called the Portland police, who actually, because it was a major theft within the organization. So um, the challenge was the employer didn't know this employee had the laptop. They just didn't have a good tracking mechanism for their own merchandise. And so the employee got away with it, but how do you live with yourself when you made that kind of decision? Because you know it's not right. I mean, it's not a right decision. So. so key questions to ask about your organization. So we uh, talked about what does ethics provide in terms of an ethical organization. So questions to ask are not only what are your personal core values and beliefs, but what are the core values and the mission of the organization. So if I was able, I'm not going to put anybody in the spot, so core values for the city, for Oregon City. Anybody want to offer those? To serve. To serve. Are they here? No. We have our goals. We have a vision and mission. Do we have a value statement? I mean, that might be a good question. Not every organization does. The fact you have a mission and vision is really important. Respecting the past while building on the future. <laughs> so respecting. I think that's building. Mm -hmm. so learning from our past mistakes, <laughs> right? You want to get extreme with it. Look at the fireman and the policeman. Okay. To serve. To serve. Walk into a burning building mm -hmm. or to look down a guy with a gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. That's right. So if you think about it, we may not have it in so many words that we could say, gosh, those are our core values, but we really do. It's to serve, to respect, to act with honesty and integrity. Those are all values of the organization. Um, how do personal values and beliefs reconcile between individuals? We talked about that. What's at risk when we make decisions? Who will be harmed? So we talked about, you know, Eric brought that up earlier. We talked about that balancing of benefit and harm. Sometimes to make a decision, someone will be harmed. It's just part of the decision process. But how do you balance it in such a way that you have greater benefit than harm? And then you can then explain that. And we'll talk about in the decision-making matrix, we'll talk about the issue of rationalization. So I see people are getting a little antsy. I know we're going to stop at about 6 for dinner. So, um, but are people feeling a need to break earlier? We doing okay? The mayor says no. Okay, we're going on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know who's in charge. <laughs> so, um, the problem is they don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, situational ethics. 
situational ethics. That's right. Very good. Yeah. It's oftentimes what happens. It's the context of the decision, right? Um, and so knowing those things as you make decisions. So I think what's important to think about light and shadow is leaders have the power to illuminate the lives of their followers or to cover them with darkness. It just, to me, it's a great visual. Mm -hmm. When you think about, we can build those people up that work for us, or we can really devalue them, as Kathy, as you said. They cast shadows when they fail to meet the ethical challenges of leadership. People who work for us, you know, I used to use this expression, assume good. Everyone comes to work wanting to do well. They typically don't come to work wanting to what? Make a mistake, cause a problem. If they do, there's probably other issues. So I think, you know, that can happen, that darkness can happen when there's an abuse of power or there's a hoarding of power, um, mismanaging information or acting inconsistently, misplacing or betraying loyalties, and really failing to assume responsibilities. For a lot of leaders, the most difficult thing is what? Is to admit you've made a mistake. Because it puts you in that really vulnerable place and you lose a power. But I find as a leader, you actually gain power in the eyes of your employees because they see that you are human and willing to be vulnerable. I, I don't think it's only a case of the leadership role. They, the fact that an individual, uh, probably somewhere in the power structure, but recognizes a mistake has been made and admits to it and attempts to resolve it, if, if in fact you come down on that person hard, you're, what you're going to do is just going to create an atmosphere where mistakes don't get admitted. Right, right. And that's a whole theory around do you lead from a punitive environment mm -hmm. or one where you really want, I mean, that's a safety perspective, where you want to constantly improve and you want people to own up to their mistakes. And you don't want to necessarily punish them always for those mistakes, right? You want to help build on those mistakes and really congratulate them for being willing to step up, because not everyone will out of fear. Kathy? Could you speak to cultural differences in ethics, which I okay. ran into a lot with people that came to work with wonderful intentions to save the world from horrible diseases, right? but came from a different culture, and it was okay to dump radiation in the sink. Right, right. Or it was okay to, you know, but it was coming out of a cultural difference. Right, mm -hmm. right. And I think that can create a lot of challenges for any organization to how do you balance the cultural diversity of employees with the values and standards of the organization. So I think that goes back to then, how do we make sure we have core values of an organization? Because an individual may have a, they may bring a cultural perspective, but they still need to be aligned with the core values, values of the organization. And I think that's the, and how do you help them along to understand that mm -hmm. from a cultural perspective? When I mean, we see that in decision making and punishment, you know, you don't, in other cultures, lie. Mm -hmm. And yet, sometimes you see not always being truthful. Right. From and there's the a peers. difference in their perception. It's a difference, right. And so how do you, you know, how do you break through those cultural diverse issues? Actually, could be a whole other training session. Oh, okay. <laughs> these these notion, notions of morals and so forth are culturally based. Well, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So it may, you know, and it all goes down to one's individual values. Okay. Because from a cultural perspective, they're going to bring different core values, just because of their culture that we may in a different culture. You know, that I may or you may or Doug may because we're each individuals and we're each influenced what, by our upbringing, our religion, our, um, you know, where we hailed from, you know, Midwest roots, Canada, Northeast, Oregon, Oregon you know, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Oregon. Some of us are natives. I mean, a lot of the tensions that we have are oftentimes centered around cultural differences or right. what, what one group feels is moral, what another group feels is not. Right. Right, and how do you how do you tease through all those? Yeah. And so one of the things we'll talk about is kind of that ethical discernment approach in terms of how do you look at an issue and try to balance all of that out. So that's 
because I think that's part of the key thing. So, so oftentimes it's asking yourself, do you have the capacity to lead? Can I, do I have the moral competence, the moral courage to be a leader in an uh, ethical organization? Um, it requires having a heightened moral capacity to really be willing to, John, be true to your own truth. To know that telling the truth and having that level of integrity is a critical piece. To being objective, to have the capacity to understand the differences that other people bring and not get polarized by that. Um, so increasing one's moral competence is key to that. So it's having that self-awareness. It's having self-confidence. It's really developing what I call this healthy, healthy moral imagination. It's being able to step back and consider the possibilities, but really do a lot of soul searching and understanding your own values. Because that often goes to one's capacity. Um, and showing that last bullet, greater resistance to outside pressures. So you're under pressure all the time from the public. But how do you make decisions that you know are the right decisions because they're for the common good? So there was, a, I can still remember this legislative person um, who's no longer with the legislature, but the story was the last person that talked to them before they hit the floor was the way they would vote. So you always wanted to be the last person. Because they could tra you could track all their voting record along that line. So you always wanted to be the last person that person was going to talk to before a vote because you wanted know to vote that way. And so, they were always influenced by the outside and by where they were getting the greatest pressure, not necessarily by doing the right thing in that particular circumstance. So developing moral competence, as I mentioned, is that self-awareness, that's personal reflection, feedback, being willing to sit down and actually have a conversation, a dialogue, and we'll talk about dialogue in a little bit, with your peers about where your strengths and weaknesses are. You know, what, what is it you see in me as a leader, or where are my weaknesses? Where do you see, if we're in a commission meeting, where I tend to demonstrate bias? Because sometimes we won't see our own biases, right? Mm -hmm. Others will see it for us. So those are the blind spots. Where are my blind spots? And understanding what those are. Um, enhancing self-confidence. Really, that's part of that mastery, being willing to challenge one's own leadership and their one's own capacity. Um, demonstrating ethical role modeling. Setting example for your follow followers is critical. So Kathy gave the great example that happened at Legacy that you saw. Ask yourself, am I serving as an ethical role model? If people were to look at me, would I want them to act the way I'm acting? Or if they acted that way, would I say, gosh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to come back to the bias notion. Uh, we pass ordinances. Those ordinances are usually restricted in some way. They restrict sure. people or groups of people in certain ways. Right. Yeah, but those come out of a value system, and those values generally are driven by we could call them the biases of individuals. What what what's more important than the other? That the right. And and you, you develop maybe a collective notion as to what those values ought to be. But I think I, I doubt if there's one of us that entered the commission that didn't come into this commission with certain values that don't, we didn't think we were being reflected at the time by the previous commission. Mm -hmm. And you could call those biases until the, we hit the point where we get most of us agreeing on, on it, and then right. it becomes a value that gets translated into an ordinance. Right. So right. biases in a, in a broad sense are not necessarily, necessarily wrong. They need to be aired, discussed, and everything exactly. else. Exactly. Yes, you need to understand what the bias is. If the challenge you have is when you have a bias, uh, where was that slide? When you have a bias that you don't admit to, it's your blind spot. Mm -hmm. Whereas, I mean, everybody brings a perspective, right, mm -hmm. to your elected position. Right. You, know, you have your values, you have your own personal beliefs, but how do you bring unity around those for the common good? 
which is the challenge. Mm -hmm. But if you have someone who's on the commission, and we've seen this in other entities, right? For people, I mean, we saw it in Multnomah County, for the city of Portland. People had certain biases, and the you know the city of Portland commissioners. Remember, they used to get to loggerheads with some of the past commissioners because they wouldn't move away from their individual bias. You know, this is what I believe in, and this is the only way, and I have no flexibility in that. As opposed to saying, this is my bias, I admit this is my bias, I own this, and being willing to talk about it and saying, but I'm willing to then set it aside for if it really is a bias to prevent sure. what's good for the common group, for the community. So I think that's what's important. Um, so we talked about, sorry, oh, we talked about enhancing self-confidence, demonstrating role modeling, um, having a, I mentioned this, having that healthy moral imagination, so oftentimes breaking away from traditional thinking, we've always done it this way, I actually call it bitty waddy because it's the way we've always done it. You know, you put bitty waddy and put a big line through it says so no bitty waddy. Just because it's the way we've, all, we've always done it doesn't mean we should continue to do it that way. Yeah. Having that healthy imagination. Um, having sound moral reasoning and follow through on ethical decisions. You know, rejecting faulty assumptions, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Really think about having, so, you know, Mary, you brought up the issue that we all come with biases. But how do we think through an issue, and we'll talk about how do we put that in some logical framework that people can understand that we've looked at the issues of justice. We've looked at what our mission and our values are. And we're being true to each of those elements. And I think that's part of that process. A good indicator of yes. that was <coughs> council working with the staff had to come to a conclusion about our water system take a ton of information and collectively agree on it to represent it to the public to convince them that this was the way to go. Right. It was based on a need, the capital N, a need. If you don't, if we don't do this collectively, mm -hmm. this is what will happen. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of different attitudes about it. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, it, it, it well not surprisingly, it, it passed, but Barely. Uh, barely. 67 barely. votes. <laughs> and that was, that was a surprise. It's still a win. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it is, but it, it, it also is with the economy today, people are thinking more with their personal wallets than the better of the city. I think so I had that just, <laughs> that influences people. Dr. Mahoney well, had a nerve. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it does influence people. I think, you know. Because they have their bias. They want that, right? 30 bucks a year in their pocket. Right. As Jim said, you, you almost get into situational ethics. Yep. Mm -hmm. But yeah. my, my point was that here's where collectively the, the council, yes. I'm not trying to shine the out for it, but it <laughs> has a spirit to me with courage. Right. Because there was money involved, lots, lots of money. Right. And public right. safety in terms of of health for right. healthy water and stuff like that. But uh, here they came together as, as a unit and uh, exercised their, their their leadership, right. so to speak. And well, the, you I get like on to it too, the collective moral courage. Yes. Yeah. To, to make a hard decision that not everyone was going to agree with, but you knew it was morally right from a variety of reasons. Betty. So I just would like to add to that. I think this commission is very well balanced because we have all of our own um, influences outside of us, all of our, you know, other people. So in my opinion, this is a very well balanced um, because every citizen I feel in Oregon City is represented. Which is important to ensure. It totally is. You have to know. You have to know what everybody's thinking, so you can have kind of a good dialogue and figure out the right way to go. Right. We, we did have one citizen that left the uh, chambers once and said, uh, we call all of them. Well, we're going to put him on that. Uh, As you know, side. being in elected <laughs> office does not mean you're going to be loved by everyone. No, it does right? not. So, but you're going to make the right decisions for the community. And that is exactly what Bob was referring to with right. this water rate thing. We did the best we could for our city. Right. And it really, you know, so it goes to this healthy ethical climate. 
you know? It's making sound decisions, protecting individual rights, but for fostering this moral reasoning, promoting integrity, and really avoiding destructive tactics. It's really being much more balanced. So it's a two-part process. It's developing personal and moral behaviors and ensuring moral influence. So you carry out your duties and shape the ethical context context of the organization, which is, you know, Ben, you just gave a great example of that. So um, it produces a number of really positive outcomes to have an ethical organization. You lower the stress level, you can reduce turnover and absenteeism, and you have greater employee satisfaction, greater employee commitment and engagement, um, a willingness to go the extra mile, improved decision making, greater levels of trust, and higher performance and productivity. I know I read through most of that because I think they're really key elements when you think about, is this all worth it? Is developing an organizational culture worth it? And I would say yes, and this is supported by the literature. You'll see this time and again, that having an organizational um, structure that's ethical leads to improved satisfaction among employees and improved levels of wanting to be part of that organization. Um, so there's some inner dimensions of leadership, and so we talked a little bit about that. It's that having that strong ethical character. So having courage to do the right thing, you know, particularly in the face of a lot of adversity sometimes. Having integrity or honesty. Having humility. Being willing to be vulnerable and admit sometimes I've made a mistake. Um, and it's not about me, right? It's about the community. Having a certain amount of reverence. Uh, having that optimism that you know we can do this. And particularly if we work in the collective, we can do this. And that sense of justice, that you really have an obligation to the common good and to the community. And you want to treat people as fairly and equitably as possible whether they're your employees or the constituents in the community. So I think enhancing ethical sensitivity is really important as a leader. You know, you're gonna actively listen. You may find you need to role play if you feel you, this is one of your weaknesses. You wanna imagine perspectives. You wanna step back. So this whole concept of um, being able to take a problem and put it, it's called third spacing, and put it in the center of the table and you step back from it and you observe it as a problem. You don't get polarized by the problem. You don't get enmeshed with the problem. You really separate it so that you have the opportunity to really think about what are the implications about making a decision about that problem or issue. Um, again, we talked about personal responsibility. And again, we go back to that humility and having that vulnerability. And as leaders, that's often the most difficult but often very important. So it involves practical wisdom versus default decisions, and I have a slide that I'll specifically, ensuring integrity, avoiding moral hazard, and we'll talk about that. Promoting freedom, that's that transparency piece, and minimizing distress. If you think about practical wisdom, it's really leading where you're looking at things and being able to question or reason, um, as opposed to, I'm gonna respond this way because I've always responded this way my habit um, or I've always made that kind of decision now that might, doesn't say that decision is not right but if you're making it out of habit as opposed to you reason that it's a good decision it's very different so some of us will have default decisions because why it's easy because this is a lot harder to take and step back and reason through so Moral freedom is that kind of knowing what's right, having the confidence, being able to really explain how I made my decision, and we'll talk about that. Um, relieving moral distress. So when employees feel that things are in unstable or there's, a, there's conflict, employees and individuals in the midst of those conflicts will feel moral distress. Mm -hmm. That's that sense of stress, that's that sense of uncertainty. People have anxiety, you know, you see calls to EAP and you know, employee assistance start going up. 
because people are uncertain about their jobs, they're uncertain about the environment. Um, and so you really want to try to minimize moral distress. And of course, reducing moral hazard, and that's making decisions uh, out of deception or being capricious or arbitrary. So it's going back to really making well-reasoned decisions, looking at bias, and then the worst thing is really is just not responding at all. Being faced with a problem and taking a road that says, well, we're just not going to do it. Because that acquiescence doesn't solve anything. It's still there. Um, but answering moral questions, you know, there's different standards and knowing what those are. And then validating. Is this because it's an authoritative fiat that we're making this decision? Or how did we reason? Really, how can we support, so when we go to the community, being able to support. So we'll talk about ethical discernment at the very end that talks about how do we support, support our decision making? And how can then the public know or the employees know that this was made with some ethical reasoning? Um, we talked a little bit about that earlier. So part of the principles are human beings should be treated with dignity and respect that uplifts the human personality. This is what employees are asking for, and I think that's what people in the community want as well. Um, talked about that. Involves really motivating one to conform to this conduct principle. Viol you know, violating the principle bothers some people's conscience. So you know, the example that the mayor gave about it would have been much more difficult for that employee who was in that hearing, not only would he be committing perjury, but he needed to be true to his own truth. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about loyalty for him. It was about being honest. And knowing, for him, his reliable guy that right and wrong. We talked about that. So moral reasoning is around forming moral judgments. I'm thinking at 6 o'clock, Nancy, good time to break. Mm -hmm. And then we can come back and talk about moral reasoning and some of the decision-making processes. And how long do you want people to break for? 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. There's dinner there, so. Yeah. And I can always uh, talk to dinner, but six, it's up to you all. Come back. Am I good? I think I'm good. Can you hear me okay? okay. So the last part of this is really to talk about kind of how do we make moral judgments, um, to give you some tools around decision making, how to avoid rationalization of our decisions, and then look at an ethical framework, what's called ethical discernment, which actually comes from the clinical model, but it has practical application for organizational and um, organizations, I'm sorry, for ethical organizations. So, Moral reasoning really has to do with forming some moral judgments, making moral assessments around worth. I mean, what is the value that we're doing through this decision? And um, so anytime we make decisions, so we talked about the ethical dilemmas, really talks about how do we apply certain standards and principles in making those decisions. But it shouldn't also contradict one's belief. So if you think back to maybe one of your recent um, council meetings or commissioner meetings where you had to make a really difficult decision, what might what might it be an example of that? Does anybody have one? They probably happen almost every week oh, yeah. <coughs> or every time you meet. So well, I could Betty. just come up with one real quick. Okay. Um, the <laughs> transportation um, plan that we amended. Um, it was pretty hard because, you know, we had people before us that didn't live in the city and we were still incorporating their street into our plan. Okay. But, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I, you know, I had to kind of weigh what was better for the city and, you know, I don't know if that helps, but okay. We had one that Owen took us into an executive session to discuss it, but one where an individual was financially harmed by a decision that we made. Uh, she would probably not be the only one, and it was very difficult not to be empathetic to her position. But the ramifications of trying to 
correct your situation, but left this open to probably a series of, mm -hmm. of, of, of other claims that would have been made on this. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a great example of trying to balance yeah. one individual need, to right, unfair mm -hmm. to others. So treating her one way and mm -hmm. would have been disparate to others. Well, I, I don't know if that was the concern. It probably wouldn't have been disparate, but we would have probably hit it with all kinds of financial claims of the same nature that we would have I had see. to uphold right. and have been perhaps somewhat costly and complicated for Got the city it. to deal with. So it was really making the decision not to act for the because of the potential for other yes. possible claims. consequences. Yeah. Possible claims. So so when we think about some of those decisions and we'll talk about the process <coughs> that you went through to make them. So those are two really good examples, you know, that we want to pull out. So so how do you make moral judgments or decisions that are defensible? You know that they can be supported by a moral principle, um, as opposed to just being decided because that was my opinion. That's the way I was feeling. You know, how do you make an objective um, judgment, if you will, and not judging simply that it's wrong, but that it's wrong for a reason that you've put together, and there's something about that decision would be the wrong decision and that you've had that forethought and we'll talk a little bit about having dialogue versus just discussing because there are difference in those so so oftentimes you have to translate values into conduct so we talked about each of you brings personal values and perspectives um, so some of those critical elements is that you seek no favors so this public officials, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be free from the even the perception of having a conflict of interest, um, much, le ha much less having a conflict of interest. You have integrity and you build that, you build trust through transparency and honesty. Um, you treat all equitably. So I think that's, you know, Mayor was an example is, you know, we weren't going to treat that one. It was best for the community as a whole that we act in a certain way to treat all the same way. And you base it on what was the ramifications for the entire community yeah. and your responsibility. Um, you build communities to demonstrate social responsibility and the commitment to public trust. So Eric, you brought up the social responsibility at the very, at the very beginning. But you really have to ensure that strong ethical culture. So we're going to go into really some tools around decision making and then this discernment process. So how do you apply the ethics of those into the decision making process? So there's, um, this part actually looks at these decision guides and a three part test. When I do this uh, example in the classroom, I actually have the students uh, have a case where someone's looking for a job promotion and they've been uh, advised by a career counselor to <coughs> fluff up I'll use that term fluff up <laughs> their um, resume to present their skills as a little different um, and then we run them through that test so we could actually apply each of these to an to an issue that actually happened within Oregon City or a hypothetical situation so I don't know if you have a situation where you faced an ethical dilemma, where you had to make a decision that didn't involve executive <laughs> <laughs> session, or we'll have to stop recording. No, so is there one that someone can come up with that was difficult? Jim, do you have one? An ethical decision period? Or, or just an ethical dilemma that was faced that we can put through where there was possibly a, 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 a right and a wrong. So in this fluffing example, is it wrong? A lot of people will put on their resume what sounds <coughs> good, but not really lying that they're making themselves a little better. A lot of people do that, right? So I, I, I did not have one like that. I had one that I thought of with your justice versus mercy thing one time. Um, okay. A, uh, a woman who was... Uh, it was a horrible crime took place in her family uh, that involved, it was just the worst kind of thing that could happen. And uh, the offender who lived in her home left the house and, she, and they come in to report this crime and uh, basically I, 
the guy ends up, the offender ends up killing himself. Horrible, horrible family thing. Fast forward a couple months, and some people are trying to help her out through a bunch of financial problems. She, uh, they give her some advice. This is what I figured out. I couldn't completely prove it. She reports that the guy who killed himself, her ex-husband's truck, was stolen, and it's found up by Hood River burned. The insurance company gets hold of us and says, hey, this stinks. And there was basically a, a time when I started looking into this, and I took it over from patrol. I was a detective at the time because it was sensitive, and she sure. was uh, she'd been a victim of this terrible thing. I basically figure out in the middle of this thing that she knew that this truck was not really stolen. I think there were some friends and there were some people who kind of gave her some advice. Yeah, and she just kind of at a at a very low point in our life where she's dealing with much bigger stuff. And I'm sitting in an interview with her, and there's a point where I figure out, she hasn't admitted it yet, but I figure out, I think she did it. And I can go for it, but I didn't go for it. <laughs> because ethically, I just, I don't know, I, I, I still have never, um, be, because it was this thing about, I mean, what? Because she had been so violated. Yeah, and, and it's, so it, it was ethics like on, on two different planes. There's the ethical plane inside of her and her insurance company right. and our police department. So ethically, she violated that. But in the grand scheme of life and the big picture of what really matters, right. I told the insurance investigator, I think she did it, but if you want to prove it, you can go prove it. <laughs> because it, it, it was just this kind of strange thing because right. it... But it's a great example of justice versus mercy. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. from a justice perspective, you had probably every ground to, yeah. you know, prosecute her, have her prosecuted for that. And yet, the, that mercy part said she's been violated enough. And if someone else wants to deal with that, but at least, I mean, you owned up to that. Yeah. I, I think a lot of these, what I keep thinking about a lot of these ethical <laughs> stuff that. I always think about, what am I going to think about this in a week? Mm -hmm. You know, what? And I knew in a week, I would always look back and wish that I had just left that alone with that. Right. And I'm, I, I'm not completely comfortable with the way that that went down. Right. But I'm much more comfortable with it than I would have been had I tried to charge her with <laughs> a false report. That just, to me, would have been wrong. It would have been more wrong. Yeah, what well, happen. and I think Does when we look sense? at these three-part tests, it's kind of like the, you know, looking at each of those to say, and that's really important. If I were to look back at my decision, am I going to be able to live with that decision? Yeah. In the future? Mm -hmm. And but it's being willing to just not react, but taking a step back and saying, what are the consequences of my actions, and how is that going to affect this situation in the long run? So, like you said, situational ethics. You know, what is that larger context, if you go back to one of those first slides, where we said it's not just that isolation, it's really, it's in this whole sense of community. And sometimes it's the best of not even a good choice. Sometimes you don't have right choices. And you right. decide what is the best. Right. So yeah, the lesser two evils. Yeah, yeah. that choice of evil mm -hmm. sometimes, because it isn't necessarily, I mean, it would be so easy if it was right versus wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we know that. But oftentimes it's either right versus right or this bad versus badder or wrong versus wrong. And how do you make that decision? That's what causes the <coughs> dilemma, the heartache, you know, that you live with afterwards where you reflect back on your decision. So on your, I don't know if you're still wanting John, to go through this. Yeah, just a scenario, yeah. So uh, this morning on NPR they were talking about gun control and sheriffs who were, um, there's some gun control laws where uh, sheriffs are somewhere actually vocally coming out and saying we're just not going to enforce this law. Right. Uh, and then Texas, there's, wasn't it? there's a new, there, there's one of the sheriffs that was <laughs> in saying. Oregon. Well, this was an Oregon one. Sorry. I don't, yeah, I don't remember all the details of this. I'm not, I shouldn't have brought it up as a good, but it is an example if where somebody, you know, is making a decision, yeah. an ethical decision on do we enforce the law or don't. So I don't know how that well, might apply you here. you got the president saying that he's not going to pursue marijuana laws even though it's a federal crime. Right. 
Yeah, right. so is that a good yeah. example for what Well, you're let's go through <coughs> some of the decision-making steps, and then we can think, see if that fits, or if we want to look at something <coughs> different. So there's like three steps to this decision guide, where you look at standards of conduct and the culture, you look at character and relationships, and you look at purpose and cons consequences. And then the three-part test really looks at our tendency when we make decisions as to what? To rationalize <coughs> why we make decisions. I can rationalize shopping just real well. <laughs> um, and some people can probably understand that, right? <laughs> but where others would be questioned, right? But if I were to sit down, if I had to justify to my mother about shopping, I might have a little bit of a uh, difficult time with that. But So the first part of the decision guide is standards of conduct. So when you look at the issue, so I mentioned this young woman who needed a new job, her job had been eliminated, and the career counselor had said, fluff up your resume. So it may be someone that you're hiring, that could be a situation. It could be the issue of, as a city, do we enforce this gun control ordinance? <coughs> we turn, take that situation on NPR and look at that. And how do we abide by that? But it focuses on the actions. It refers to principles that are governing the community. So you're going to ask, what are the standards in the community that they would consider morally appropriate <coughs> or inappropriate? And how does the community articulate moral rules? Hmm. So if we think about the community of Oregon City, what would the standard be? So if we want to use, John, that one on gun control. Hmm. Maybe we want to use the one on development issues. Might be easier, right? <laughs> Maybe not. What are the standards of the community? Transparency. Transparency. So that so they could likely abide by a decision as long as how that decision was made there was transparency. <coughs> Other thoughts? Well, they want to be heard. Yeah. Listening. Okay. I mean, you have to listen to what they say. Right. So they want to have a voice yes. <coughs> in the decision-making process. Although we talked about at the break, oftentimes, who comes and to have the voice mm -hmm. to meetings? It's usually the ones that are more averse, yes. adverse to the decision, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So, because you don't often hear from those that are supportive unless there's some, been some conscious effort to get them out <coughs> so that there's a balanced representation. We had, um, uh, had a case where a m medical marijuana dispersing entity wanted to be in Oregon City. Mm -hmm. We were able to reject it because it, it's out by the federal government, not the, the right. federal by the state government. I did pose the question. I said, well, what if we leave a, a federal law is not appropriate or something of that nature and when you're faced with the same dilemma does that require us to take that same kind of action on something else and the answer was no so I guess we could pick and choose in some sense as to whether we wanted to adopt a state standard or whether we wanted to adopt a federal standard or right. something of that nature. But wouldn't the community want consistency? Well I would think it depends on the particular issue I mean we don't have to go too too far back in terms of Constitutional interpretation, where we've got—I sure. mean, we've got—we've <coughs> we've got various uh, what do you call them, homeowner associations, mm -hmm. and where their rules were discriminatory. Right uh, now, right. and it was probably constitutional at the time. It is no longer that. Now, the city at the time could have taken the position: oh, those are unenforceable. We're not going to—we're you know, right. not going to abide by those. So, uh, if you look at the timeline of things mm -hmm. that we've seen just within our lifetimes in terms of right. constitutional interpretations. And usually they're made up, made up by some people who are taking a stand that was illegal at one time and, and took their case to the court system. So, right. And I'm sure there's jurisdictions that have probably done that as well. Right. Who, is anybody here with the health department? No. Clark was kidding. Was kidding. Interact with health department on the city level? <laughs> So there's a new policy that's coming out of, around immunizations. It's going to affect the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll affect businesses that for years through the state, um, the vaccine for children's program has existed. So the children could receive vaccines even if there was no ability to pay. And the county was often the distributor of those vaccines. 
Well, the CDC has gone back to a law that was in place in the 1800s that says it used to be that you get the, it's called advanced credit. It used to be you'd get the vaccine on credit and then at the, it was used, you could bill for those that were, who had insurance and then it could be paid for. Um, now, CDC has said we're no longer doing that because under this 18 law from the 1800s, it says the federal government cannot advance you money. And advancing you product is advancing you money. So <coughs> counties, you have to pay for your vaccines. State, you have to pay for your vaccine before we give it to you. Now what this means is children may go without vaccines. Others will be, and the communities will be affected because there's going to be higher risk of exposure to otherwise preventable communicable diseases. But CDC is going back to this law of 1800s to enforce this provision. So there's a, a large um, outcry happening within the state and the county health departments around this use of vaccine and this very old rule. And it's not that it was broken. States were paying, but someone decided, well, we can no longer advance credit. There goes your student loan program. There goes your student loan <laughs> program, yeah. <laughs> right, so, so it's interesting. I mean, you make a really good point. When is a, you know, a law or an interpretation of a law more archaic, even though it may exist, should it still be applied the same way or should it be actually improved upon? Mm -hmm. And yes, it serves its purpose, and by this letter of the law, they're doing the right thing, but by the spirit, they're putting people at risk. Mm -hmm. And they're not only putting those children that aren't going to be vaccine, vaccinated, they're putting others in the community yeah. at potential risk. Mm -hmm. And you're treating children differently. Because now, children who have insurance can, will get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Children who don't may not. Yeah, yeah kind of thing. So, um, so here you look at what standards do we use for making decisions in the community and can we articulate those from a moral position? Um, so we often function on, you know, are they widely shared or observed? So within your own community. Um, so this has to do, I mean, this Harvard ethicist talks about, you know, people becoming aware that most people do their best and it's built on honesty, reliability, fairness, and respect. So when we think about how decisions are made as a community entity, we should be applying those same <coughs> basic standards in making those decisions. So establishing an ethical culture to maximize um, success, each organization really needs to evaluate and then integrate what those standards of conduct are. What is the expectation? So it's Maureen, right? So you said transparency. Do we use transparency in our decision making? Is that a standard of conduct that we can agree to? John, it gets back to one of your points is how do we defend some of these decisions? Sometimes it's by being transparent and then by being consistent. And how do we do that? So, so it's understanding what those core elements of one's community are and then um, putting them in place and then also identifying possible conflicts. Because as we said, you know, the naysayers are the ones that are going to come to the meeting to have the largest outcry. And they're often the minority, mm -hmm. but yet they can be a very loud mm -hmm. minority. So how do you balance that to make sure that we're still doing the right thing for the community? <coughs> um, so these are the common ethical principles that, and I didn't spend a lot of time tonight going through them, but I wanted to provide it to you we talk about beneficence. How do we bring benefit through our actions? Uh, Non-maleficence is about avoiding harm. So when you think about it, and we get to the ethical discernment, we apply some of these. Um, autonomy. People should be free to make their own choices. And certainly in our culture, that is, I mean, that's why we don't have presumed consent on certain things, because people want to be able to have a voice in the decision-making process. Justice, people ought to give others what they are due, but operate from <coughs> a sense of fair play. 
So we have some equality and fairness. And then responsibility really isn't an ethical principle, but it's often discussed as an ethical principle because people should have certain expectations of themselves, but they should also, it should be reciprocal. So we talk about people coming and understanding the decisions that need to be made. Well, they have to have some responsibility for their own and accountability for their own decisions as well. So the second part of the discussion guide really is taken from this virtue ethics and it deals with character and relationship. Can we focus to walk the talk or walk to talk? Um, <clears throat> organizations need to find ways of doing business that embody the character traits that we all aspire to. <coughs> so we talked about, Bob was Bob, right, was mm -hmm. here. He talked about service. He talked about integrity. <coughs> Kathy, you brought up the issue of diversity. And what do we learn from the habits of those and how do we incorporate those into the business of our decision making? So some of these character traits, um, they're formed or become patterns of behavior. Remember we talked about you just want, don't want to do something because it's a habit. But sometimes it's good to look at, the, and it's really the consistency part of that. Um, it really requires an evaluation about what is it that we're deciding on. And fundamentally, it asks these questions. What do we want to achieve? But oftentimes, it's really about what do we want to be? What is it about the decision that is going to benefit our community? So character is important in developing and sustaining relationships. So we talked, we went back to the very, very first slide. We talked about ethics is about being in a right relationship. It's how we treat each other with mutual respect. It's, you know, it takes into consideration issues around being dysfunctional or functional, being constructive or critical, being open, being respectful, being Constructive and critical are two ends of the spectrum, like dysfunctional and, and functional are. But it talks about developing and maintaining these positive relationships. So as we look at decision making, how do we build in, in our decisions, that character and relationship, and how we, so Betty, you brought that up. How do we give voice to those that have an opinion about a particular issue? Right? Ensuring we have a consistent approach to that. The third step in the discussion guide talks about um, what are the purposes and consequences. This comes from the utilitarian approach around consequentialism. And it talks about the focuses on moral importance of selecting the right goals, and using the right resources to achieve the goals. It goes back, Eric, you brought it up at the very beginning, that balancing when we're making decision. Um, we want to make sure we're delivering value but it has to look at the community for the common good and not just a single individual or those single individuals who have the loudest voice that may not balance for the whole community. Doug, did you want to say something? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so you want to make sure you're delivering value to the stakeholders, either your employees or those in the community. And you want to identify relevant purposes. So some of this is analyzing where you are as an individual but also understanding where the community's at and what the community expectations are. You know, Kathy, I've heard a lot of words here today about transparency, and I think that's something that we need to analyze in what it means to us, but what it means to the community, too. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Mm -hmm. right. And we haven't defined it, but that's a really good point. So, you know, we talked about earlier in the um, evening around the perception. Mm -hmm. So how we act and how we behave means something to us, but oftentimes it's going to be <coughs> judged by those that are looking at us. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point. How we define transparency as a group, and you said in the collective, could be very different than how the community defines right. transparency. Mm -hmm. you know, what is their expectation of how standards and how characteristics are, are um, delivered or presented? So that's a great point. So oftentimes when we make decisions, we tend to rationalize how we made those decisions. Um, so you oftentimes will find yourself convincing yourself that a decision was fair and defensible. It's 
excuse me, fair and defensible when it actually only serves your own interests or offers an easy way out. So this is like a three-part test. It's the publicity, the reversibility, and generalizability that you can apply. And it doesn't make a difference whether it's this young woman who wanted to fluff up a resume and was trying to justify that that was OK. Um, or if you're making a major decision about what should we put in place the gun ordinance or should we allow a medical marijuana location and we make the decision not to. So how do we, in essence, justify that and demonstrate that we've considered that? So the publicity test says you should scrutinize your decision by asking the tough question. Could you defend it if your choice was made public, when all of your choices are made public? So I go back to the media test. What I said I called the M&M &M test, mom and the media. <clears throat> this allows you to consider if your reasoning is sound and justified or biased and self-serving. But if you had to clearly say, could I defend this if this were on the front page of Willamette Week or the Oregonian? Or if I was sitting across the desk or table, my mom's gone, rest her, God rest her soul. But if I had to sit across from my mother, my dad would be a piece of cake. But my mom, <laughs> you know, if I had to justify to my mother that this is why I did that, we always we always went to our mom and not our dad. Isn't that true? <laughs> uh, my brothers would tell you I had my dad wrapped around my finger. I don't know if that's true, but, um, but yeah, but that's a whole other thing. But um, so it's really stopping and thinking. Okay, when you're making a decision, can we pass a publicity test? Yeah. Jim. Yeah, this is making me think of some. I was at a chief's meeting here this week, and. The chiefs as a group were talking about their legislators who are talking about preemptively coming up with the marijuana law. Mm -hmm. Why put it in the hands of a referendum? Why don't we just get ahead of the ball, create our own, that we, we know it's coming so we can kind of manage it. Right. Should we do that? And so the chiefs as a group were saying, do we as the OACP, the, the Oregon Associate Chiefs of Police, do we support it? Do we get involved? What do we do? The conversations were kind of limited into two groups. There was a group who was saying, it is coming. We'll probably in a better, be in a better position to at least make it as palatable and as good as we can by getting ahead of it. And then there was the other faction was concerned about publicly what are people going to think of this? What are victims advocates groups going to think? What are the uh, right. uh, all of the partners that we've had for years and years in uh, drug abuse, drug court, all these things? And I don't know. Just thinking about this, they're kind of both right. You know, I, I, you could say it's an ethical decision to do the best you can to, if you can't meet them, join them and try and control what you can. But at the same time. I don't know, just how will that be perceived by others yeah. who may have different values or different and, it, and to them it's not really a popularity contest that, no. that, that they're happy with the police. It's, it really means right. something to their core just because of the group they associate with. So. Yeah, yeah. Because they're so, I mean, their values of that group yeah. are so focused. It's a good example. Mm -hmm. The next one, the reversibility test, allows you to make kind of that fair and defensible decision by putting yourself in the position of the person that would potentially be harmed by the decision. So as we said earlier, every decision, right, isn't going to please everybody. Someone will benefit and someone will typically be harmed to a certain extent. You want to mitigate that harm as much as possible, but you know it's still going to happen. Um, <clears throat> Would you agree with or respect the reasons for the decision? So if you, you know, kind of were in that position where you reversed, if you were the one asking for this and didn't do it, could you live with that decision? So you kind of reverse roles is what this is asking you to do. And would the one who was adversely affected endorse the reasons of the decision, not whether they would disagree or agree? Because they're going to disagree, right? Because they didn't get their way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but could they endorse it? So were the reasons laid out in such a way that they could at least live with them if they had to 
even if they couldn't agree or disagree. And then the generalizability test really raises this issue of consistency. <clears throat> Could you defend your decision using the same reasoning in a similar case? So it gets to kind of, are we making decisions in a consistent way? And could we apply these same standards, the same steps, in a similar situation, not necessarily in a different situation, but in a similar case? So if someone else came and wanted to establish you know, <clears throat> some type of other contra potential contraband entity, mm -hmm. retail shop, would we use the same approach using your medical marijuana? thing with medical marijuana is it's sanctioned, yep. not by the feds, but sanctioned with the state. Yep. So would there be other situations that are sanctioned by the state and not feds that we could do that? We so could we be, medical what's that? Mushrooms. We have a rickshaw in Portland now <laughs> down the water. <laughs> right. Medi med medical marijuana a rickshaw. rickshaw. <laughs> 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 so, but if, so if in applying this test, you realize you're creating a new standard, <coughs> it really casts doubt on the fact that, gosh, have we really based this decision? If we've just made a decision that creates a whole new standard, <coughs> is was it the right original decision? So you used the case earlier about making a decision not to accept a claim from an individual. Because if you had, it likely would have created a whole new standard that you would have then had consequences yeah. from that standard. But by holding the line, if you will, you, d you held to the original standard, which was not to accept that, and you didn't create a new standard. See the difference? Mm -hmm. So. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, and none of this is. And I think that's the challenge with ethics. Gosh, if these were easy decisions, we wouldn't be spending three <laughs> hours tonight doing this, right? Um, so when you think about good decisions, did I use the decision guides to help facilitate the case and look at a moral decision? Did I think through and address what the ethical challenges were? Did I gather the right information? So in ethical discernment, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Did I check the facts and did I include the right people? So was it a well-balanced decision or did I only take information from one side and then move forward with the decision? That's right. Um, did I use a fair process? Did I set aside my biases? Um, is my decision consistent with the law and or the expressed values of the community? And if I applied that three-part test, publicity, reversibility, and generalizability, what would the results be? So this would be one framework for decision making that you could use in making a good decision. Ethical discernments provide another tool for making decision. So this is, a, I always appreciate this picture because it shows this confluence of kind of two rivers coming together. And oftentimes in ethical, discernments, you have the two sides where you have to bring things together. Um, so you need to have in integrity in the boardroom or in the commissioner room. You have to have some type of model, and then you have to act on that. So this is uh, healthcare, because some of this work was actually taken from the healthcare setting in development of ethical discernment. Um, Providence and Peace Health, two of the larger Catholic health organizations in the community, uh, really did a lot of this preliminary development work. So Father Tui, some of you may know, was really instrumental in the development of this. And of course Providence, it's now Providence Willamette Falls. I still want to call it Willie <laughs> Falls. It was my first place I ever nursed so um, in the ICU there. So I'm, I immediately go back to its original name. But, so it talks about, and we talked about some of these things earlier. You talk about practical wisdom versus default decisions. We talked about that. Um, ensuring integrity and reducing those moral hazards because we've made good decisions. And having that freedom because we know we've made the right decision. So you decrease the moral distress. 
So being ethical and making decisions, again, goes back to that integrity and honesty piece. It talks about, and this is this uh, book by Laura Nash, Good Intentions Aside, A Manager's Guide to Resolving Ethical Problems. It's a great resource. Um, but she talks about ethics at the heart really depends on having honesty, fairness, dependability, and accountability. So those are concepts we talked about tonight. Um, so this on the left side is around, again, it was based on some health care, where you do consultations because you're doing a single individual that you're typically trying to resolve a single at the bedside type of discussion. Whereas discernment really looks at a broader perspective, really um, considering the whole picture, considering the ability to understand the elements of the issue and not having just opinion, but considering what the insight is. And we'll talk a little bit about this. This is the typical ethical decision model when we use in the clinical setting. So I did a clinical consult um, just I was through, actually through our church, was called in on a consult for a young man who there was a decision whether or not we should, the family was really wrestling with do we withdraw life-sustaining treatment for him. And um, so the family asked me to come over and help them sort through the discussion. And I used this model where we looked at what are the elements for this young man around what's going to be beneficial for him, what are his preferences, what's his quality of life, and what are the other issues around um, how will he not be harmed. And that's the basis for the clinical model, and it also applies when we apply it then in the organizational sense, because we want to look at how does this bring benefit, what's the integrity of this, and I'll show you that. So the foundational question on the clinical side, and again, the organizational side is built from this, because organizational ethics in and of itself is only, it's very young, if you will, and kind of a theory around for organizations. Um, but it looks at, again, the clinical integrity, the beneficence, the autonomy, and the justice component. When you think about the organization, this is the model. And if we had a specific problem, we could go through that. So the upper left-hand side, you think about, this is the ethical decision. So I'll give you one that we actually dealt with that one of the uh, health systems I um, worked with previously. They were looking at subcontracting out all the gardening work at the facilities to a third party. And they were looking, at, it meant layoffs, and it meant outsourcing that business. So you probably may deal with some of that same type of outsourcing issue. We use this ethical discernment model in making the decision. The decision ultimately, even though it would save the facility money, was not to do it. Because it was contrary to the mission and the tradition of the organization. Because it meant people would lose jobs, families would be negatively infected, and then they made the decision there had to be another way to save money. And so here in the left-hand corner, you look at, well, what is the mission of the organization? Um, what's the common good? So what does that mean from the community? And I have another slide to look at. Who are the stakeholders? Who needs to be involved? And what are those traditions? What are the standards within um, the organization? So in making the decision, is it the honest representation of the mission? That's why, you know, we talked about, Jim, the mission is up here, right? To build a sustainable, healthy community that promotes safety, economic opp opportunity, livability, environment, and uniqueness. So when you're making a decision, if you were to go to that top circle and you looked at a particular issue, could you say that decision is consistent with your mission? And that's the first question. Then, the second is the common good. Does this make us more or less dependable for our contribution to the common good? Who's involved? Who are the stakeholders? Does this reflect a fair distribution of benefits or burdens? Or in the case of this layoff, it meant one select group of people were going to be harmed. 
where others would not be. And can we explain the decision in light of this broader context? Remember, this came out of the Catholic health organizations, so that's why it says the Catholic, but you could say also your civil traditions in that case. So the process is really one where you identify what is the question. That's why I was trying to see, is there a particular ethical issue that you've had within the commission that we could actually put through the framework? Who's the decision? Who's the ultimate decision maker? You know, is it the commissioners? Is it someone outside the commission? Um, who are the stakeholders and who are the partners? There's this process where you develop a white paper where you actually go out and interview all of the stakeholders, get input and voice. So on a community issue, you would involve, you may have community focus groups to do this. You do that polling and um, interviewing process. The white paper is both looking at the literature, pulling community input, and putting it all together in a document. You pull an interview. What's interesting is you actually send it out to stakeholders, the white paper, and get their insights. And I'll talk about the difference between opinion and insight in a minute. You have a facilitated dialogue, which means you have a discussion where you go through all the elements. And then from that, you come up with a decision. And we use that three concentric circle or four concentric circles to actually lay it out. So if we had an issue and I had a grease board, we'd just say, OK, this is the issue. OK, where does that fit the mission? And you literally draw it out in the schematic. It takes a lot of work, too. It takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But and it's you may good. not do it with every decision. But when you have really critical yes. decisions that you know are going to be controversial, or going to impact a lot of people, taking the time to go through a very clear ethical discernment helps you, I think, as an organization to justify your actions. We could actually use the mill site in that situation if you were to go back. One slide. No, wait, wait, wait. Which one? One more. So if you put the... This one? No. The brown mm -hmm. one. The brown one. Yeah, this one. Yeah. This one? So, yeah. Sorry. So that's okay. So, if you were to put the Willamette Falls Legacy Project up there, okay. And the, the white paper is what staff and, and everybody's been doing. And we are in the um, polling process having focus groups. Right. To figure out what the income, what the end product is going to be. So what's the issue again? Well, we have the mill site. Oh, right. right. So we're looking yes. at what are we going to do with that yeah. site? So um, that's the that's a great example. That's the decision that we have to make as a commission once we have it all vetted through the system. Right. So then my question when I think about that is the polling. So. There are surveys that can be filled out by citizens if they can't go to a meeting. Mm -hmm. So do I put my survey and my bias in at this point, or do I do that at the kind of the discussion point? So the discussion because I don't want to I don't want to skew the the end result or the survey right by inputting myself right now. So during the facilitated discussion, it's not about opinion. It's about insight. Okay. So if you have opinions, it's really earlier on when you're doing the polling and interviewing that people voice what their opinions are about right. the project. Right. So that when you get down to the decision making part, with the group coming together, you're able to look at all the feedback. But do I fill out the survey and put my bias in at this at the polling interviewing? Or is that because you're a stakeholder and a member of the community? Yeah. Well, and I'm going to be helping with the final decision. Right. So then the question is, do you have to recuse yourself? Right. Because of your elected position, and you may need to, because you're an ultimate decision maker. Yeah. So I don't know. I just uh, thought I, that was a good one. Well, no, that might be an individual decision. I don't see the, I don't see the conflict. Right. Because I mean, you are still a community I'm member. I'm still a community member. Yeah. I, I'm not going to be identifying them myself on the survey, I presume. Right. And, uh, Right. So I'm not going to be influencing any of the decision uh, 
of, of the planners or anybody else in the right. process. Right. And typically the way the development of the white papers happen in the polling and interviewing, it's a, a like an individual who's not involved with the decision making, who's actually pulling it all together. Yeah. Yeah. And all that feedback is all anonymous. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So I think the problem with is that, you know the water park that you want there. You know, you're the only one out of all the interviews. And then you get the decision, you still want your water. Park. I still want the water. Park. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah right. that, that, that might be the issue. But the, I think you would illustrate I'm still going to push point. for it. it might, you'd illustrate my point that if an individual came up with the unique idea that all of a sudden everybody thought it was a good one and never got brought up in the first yeah. place so because of, right. of that yeah. kind of decision. No, That's I, why I say you should be doing it. I agree. Yeah. I just wanted to go through the process. Yeah, and no, be no. The devil's advocate, <laughs> sort of. You no, know? but that's a great example of really a potentially controversial yeah. issue. That you could use this approach. Yeah, but it wasn't anonymous. To teach. <laughs> 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 <You're> right. <laughs> no. I'm I that up. <laughs> <laughs> no. So uh, when we talk about that facilitated dialogue, um, I mentioned this earlier, it's about having a dialogue and not a discussion. Mm. And I think differentiating those two things is really helpful, because a dialogue starts with listening, as opposed to discussion often starts with speaking. Um, it's about speaking with on the dialogue as opposed to speaking to. It focuses on insights and not opinions or differences. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes discussions are what? They're adversarial. People have opinions, mm -hmm. which leads to being polarized, which leads to the adversarialness. And versus being collaborative, when you're having a dialogue with someone, it's about hopefully looking for a solution and being more collaborative. Generating ideas versus conflicts, Encouraging reflection versus just kind of off the hip making a quick decision or quick thinking. And it encourages uh, emergence. So, so something will emerge from the dialogue as opposed to, again, being polarized or locked in. So just that discussion. So this is a um, picture is of Prudence or Prudential who, you know, is both looking back You'll see she has two faces. She's looking back, but she's also looking forward. Here she has a flute to talk about how do we have harmony, sense of collaboration. I thought it was an eyeglass. That's right. <laughs> well, she has an eyeglass on one side, but she has a flute on the other. Because she has an eyeglass. Because I, I see a mirror and I see it's a, a, I see a telescope. Oh, <laughs> 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 sometimes that is, a that is a telescope about four weeks. I don't inhale. <laughs> sometimes she'll have a flute, <laughs> which talks about harmony. Very good. You were paying attention. And then the little serpent talks about shrewdness. How do we make not shrewdness from an evil perspective, mm -hmm. but shrewdness from a positive? As opposed to that sense of moral distress where you're doing nothing, and unfortunately it's cut off in this image, but where you're juggling everything. <coughs> and you can't have that sense of harmony. And, uh, yeah. came out of my coloring book. It's got numbers. That's compliments of Father. This is compliments of Father, too, and footnotes are on my laptop. That's my kind of so, as I mentioned, <laughs> so as I mentioned, it's about. <laughs> Not about opinions, but it's about insights. So when you see this, what do you see? Stop. 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 It's a big dipper. Yeah. A no. Big dipper. Or if I can get it forward. Do oh. you see that? So our opinion was that's what we saw, but maybe our insight is that there's something much richer there. <laughs> Again, or as was said, so uh, to me it's a great visual about how one can have an opinion, but there could be something much richer when you look at from an insight. 
So in building ethical or organizations, and we're actually down to the last slides and we can just open for general comments, but you want to ensure organizational ethical fitness. So you want to embrace the ethical conduct. You want to really talk about, we talked about transparency. Kathy, you raised such a great issue about, as did Maureen, about transparency, but how is that defined? And what does that mean for us? And what does that mean for the community? Um, you want to be committed to transparency and trust. You want to integrate the values. So we talked about some of the values of respect, of having a voice. Um, you want to fil facilitate a climate of accountability. You want to recognize diversity. You have diversity. I mean, we talked about that just a few minutes ago. You have certain people that are going to have certain opinions because those that's where they're coming from, or that's what their culture has them. Um, and you want to respect the contributions of that diversity. And as leaders, you want to lead by example. You want to be ethical leaders. Um, you want to create an ethical environment, which means you have a zero tolerance for destructive behaviors. So I think there's a sense that not everybody wants to be in a functional environment. And how do you address those mm -hmm. issues? You want to have integrity, which is ethical soundness and wholeness and that consistency. You want to have leadership that is committed to the values of the organization. Um, you want to be concerned for how we make decisions and how do we base those decisions. Structurally reinforced, but you have also that social responsibility and accountability to the community. So I think there's some important tools. You need to have shared values. And so you have your mission and your vision statement, but maybe it's in exploring, well, what are the values that are behind that? Um, you want to have standard, standard of conduct and code of ethics within the organization, which I know we do. I mean, I was out at the Oregon City website, and I know you've got a whole section on ethics. Um, I'm not sure how often people access that. You have continuous ethical improvement, which means you're always willing to look at how we make our decisions. Are there new ways to do it? And you have leadership, again, that's willing to role model those expectations for employees. So then it's really putting ethical discernment into action. How do you take all these elements and make them possible? I mean, I was saying to Jim at the break, what an incredible contribution to employees, the managers in the front line, to actually, and I guess Dave, you know, as city manager, you were very involved in this as well, to commit the time and the money for them to all go through an ethical training. And see, each of their trainings is different than what you had tonight. So the managers are going to get through, uh, go through an ethical training that's really focused more on what does it mean to manage in an ethical environment. Some of this will be repeated, but others, it's new. And the front line is really talks about what does it mean to be an employee in an organizational uh, environment that's ethically based. So, so part of it is taking that that mill site is a great example of one you could do a discernment on. <laughs> you know, I mean, we kind of started on that. So, just general questions. I know we have a few minutes. In. Comments? <laughs> you back, Carol? Um, I kind of have maybe an insight. Uh, Kathy was talking about transparency, and we hear we hear that a lot. And and what does it mean? And and looking through the slides, especially the two slides, the reversibility test and the the generalizability test, right. those two That's tests. That's a terrible word to say. Isn't it, it is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but um, to me, transparency means nothing hidden. So consistency, and that was brought up in the reversibility test. Mm -hmm. And then explain the reasons behind the decisions. Really communicate that right. so people understand what went into the decision-making process and have them part of it too, if right. possible. Right. Participation, um, and then don't change rules. You know, midstream and integrity. Do what you say. You know, right. you're, you're going to. And and some you know some people might throw transparency out when we make a decision they don't agree with. Right. But if we know that we're putting in the effort to communicate right. and get that message across and that we're showing the reasons and really making a good faith effort to explain right. ourselves, I think, to me, that's transparency. We're not leaving anything hidden. Right. Yeah, so you're, you're opening, you're being open to that. Now, you're always going to have some people that will disagree. 
Right. And that just comes with it, but that doesn't <coughs> mean that you haven't made that good faith effort mm -hmm. and you're doing it in a consistent way. And that's part of having an ethically um, mm -hmm. sound organization. Is that what you're thinking? Well, sense, I'm, well, I'm thinking there's a lot of different versions of, of transparency. transparency. Oh, yeah. yeah, how people yeah. define yeah. transparency. Yeah. Right. Right. It's a <laughs> word that you throw out and yeah. well, catch us somewhere. Right. And John, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you said it at the break in terms of how people see government. They just don't trust government. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how do you break Including through yeah. and help them develop that trust? And so much of that comes with what integrity and the ability to be truthful. But the, it challenge, the challenge to transparency, Sorry. though, is, I mean, <laughs> people don't really want to take the time to um, figure out what's going on at right. their local government level. And, you know, so we spend a lot of time trying to tell our story and it's and and then you you know those people who are really frustrated with it show up at the last meeting, and they don't have a sense of how many public meetings or how much public information or how much you know website update is there. So it is a tough it is a tough problem to overcome. I'm not sure if it's so much if people don't take the time, but I think everybody has their own individual definition of transparency. Right, and so it's hard to. Right. You can't just have you know mm -hmm. one idea of transparency and have it fit everybody. Well, right, and that's why what the commission may think is transparent and what the community may think is transparent would <coughs> be very different. Right. It's kind of integrity. So you know when integrity is missing. You likely know when transparency is missing. I mean, in the same way. So yeah. what what happens is you complicate what Eric's observation just was, which I agree with. Every individual has their view of what is transparent. And then you overlay that with the national statistics, which consistently show that the least trusted body of government is the federal government, followed by state government, and that local government is actually trusted slightly above 50%, which is more than double the trust folks have, for example, for Congress. So, so we are trying to get that message out into a, a, a pool of information that is bombarding the populace Right. Uh, from other decisions that are affected, affecting their lives, uh, for many of which they feel like they have no input, no results. Here they can, they can at least come pound on my desk or call the right. mayor or someone. They they have a, they have access to us. Right. And which is a great point, I think, which Betty made as well. Yeah. Is by having greater constituent either involvement, engagement, or representation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you see that more in the local. Yeah, government. but people tend that. to generalize, I don't trust government. Right. Mm -hmm. And government <laughs> can right. mean lots of things, too. Yeah, yeah what does that mean? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and with executive session stuff, I mean, most yes. of our divisive in issues are executive session stuff, mm -hmm. which in the public's mind, that should be something they know. That's yeah. that's the that I mean the things that our public wants to be transparent are things that we can't talk about mm -hmm. most of the time. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, so that's that's, that's the real that, problem. Uh, that, yeah. that, that and helping really them hasn't. understand because what they perceive is you're just making decisions right. behind closed right. doors. Yeah. yeah. Right. Where you're really held to the fact that you have right. to be behind closed doors on certain issues. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Even in our voting process, and this is not this commission, but a previous commission, we had a, there was a vote taken, there was four in favor, one against, and the person that voted against it, never in the discussion, said the reason he was against it, and then the mayor asked him, why, why was the negative vote? He says, well, I'm not ob obligated to tell you that. And so it's, it's important when we're making decisions, even if we're abstaining, to to put the argument ahead of yeah. ahead of the game right. so that everybody understands it. For one thing, if you really want to sway people your direction, you want to make sure they know your reasons for, right. the, for the argument anyway. But right. Well, that's uh, part of the ground rules of collaboration, yeah. isn't it? That we yeah. all be willing to own up to what our, right. have the moral courage right. to own up to why we're making a decision, right. you know, what is influencing that, right. as opposed to saying, well, I don't have to tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great, great acquiescence. <laughs> so, no offense to the person that did that. But. Uh, well, I think part of my issue with transparency is I had it just happened to me last week, 
And then I had to go home and think about, okay, was that lack of transparency or was it how much do I want to be bombarded with information? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. <laughs> Right. You know, am, am I going to hold these people responsible for telling me everything that goes on in every yeah. office all day, yeah. Yeah. all week? Right, right. right. Um, so is there nice to know and a need to know? Right. And sometimes it's, I need to know this, but and is that sufficient? And yeah. part of that is just the understanding, the expectation you develop within your own group. Mm -hmm. about what, it, what are those need to know pieces and with the community? Some things they need to know. Some people will want to know what? Everything. Mm -hmm. And if you told some people everything, they'd still say you still were not enough. Exactly. <laughs> we'll say you forgot to remind me. That's <laughs> right. Oh my you God. told me that once, but I Ultimately, you can't make everybody happy all the time. No, that. no. <laughs> and I think having that recognition that that is part of it. So. Yeah. I forgot. It's your fault. Other <laughs> comments, questions? Things we didn't talk I know it was a lot of material in a short period of time. But, you know, as I said to Jim and Robert, we really wanted to focus on, you know, ethical leadership, give you some tools, talk about the ethical organization. Are there comments, questions before I wrap up? I think it was just interesting when you talk about you, your morals and your ethics as an individual and trying and that they should be in the workplace. But you do, not, for, I think for a lot of, you know, for me, you know, there, you, we do have this, this separation of power, though. You have, right. you have a decision-making body, and you have a staff that implements. And, right. and there was a discussion there about, in, in, you know, like the, the civil rights in the 50s and the 60s, you know, mm -hmm. and the civil, mm -hmm. civil disobedience. And, you know, it's hard for a staff person to do in terms of we've adopted a code, it's codified, it's my job to implement it. Right. And what happens and, when you don't agree with it? And that? I can take up exactly what the code says, and the policymakers can decide. We're going to ignore staff. We're going to ignore the city records because we think we should go in a different direction. And, that, right. and so, it's it's it's, 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 it's it's really hard yeah. sometimes to take that personal value. I mean, I suppose if they said you know something so outrageous, that's where it comes down to: do you really want to work right. here or not? Right, right, right. But you know, I think that for the frontline employee, I mean, there, we do have jobs to do, right? And, it, and it's to and it's to implement. The code that's been adopted here, and sometimes you know, there's parts of the code I don't agree with, but right. it's not my job necessarily. Mm -hmm. I, it's not my job to ignore it. Certainly, it's my job to have the you know, if that discussion comes up, to try and influence policy. Right. Um, but in the end of the day, you know, I guess that's. I just think there's different hats that get worn at different levels within a public organization. Absolutely, I think so too, and I think what the challenge there is when you find your core value in a conflict. How do you reconcile that? And can you reconcile that as an individual that allows you to continue to function in your job? Or is something, as you said, potentially so outside your ability to reconcile that it may not be the right place for you? You know, that's inherent even, I know you're an attorney, that's another conflict. I actually personally went through this because uh, I spent almost 10 years of my life as a police officer and a homicide detective in a big city. Then I became a lawyer, and the court said, we'd like you to be a court-appointed uh, defense attorney for some of these <laughs> indigent uh, homicide suspects. And I said, you know what? I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'll do anything else. Yeah. But I spent a decade putting these guys away, and I don't really want to use the skills I have now to help them get out. Right. And <laughs> that was sort of a, now I know you do have to have a commitment to the system, and so I played a role, and what happened right. was, I took one of these things, I had the officer on the stand, I knew everything that was missing from the report instinctively, and it was scary how, how I took the whole thing apart and got my guy off. Right. It was almost scary how good I was at doing that, and I thought, I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> Morally, I cannot do this, you know, right. I felt kind of bad after it was over, and of course the the public defender's office was trying to hire me the next day, and I was a big rock star to them, but to me, I was, I had just sort of soiled myself a little bit. Well, right, because your <laughs> instinctive core values Yeah, I thought, man, violent, I, just, were I, just the, I just shared the whole playbook, you know? <laughs> you know and right. it was, it was really a dis, it was an unfair advantage almost, I felt, that I had in asking 
some of these guys the questions who clearly had less training and experience than I had <coughs> in homicide investigation. Right, yeah. Because you so, knew all the pieces that were missing. So I said, I'll do anything except that and family law. <laughs> so yeah. I, had to, I had to make a decision. Yeah. You yeah. had to be true to your own values yeah. at that point, and you that knew that, boy, I could do this job great, but could I look at myself in the mirror the next morning? Yeah. Police officer, lawyer. <laughs> I kind of, I'm trying to figure He's out. He's not a nurse lawyer. I was like, right? figure out why I ever voted to hire him. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm on your side. <laughs> You're great when they're on your side. Because you knew he had a good start. <laughs> You still don't have that marijuana store. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So that's a great example, though, of you know having your core values in such conflict where you yeah. just can't reconcile. Them. Yeah. And you know, so when I do this exercise with students, I in the, in the personal ethics course, I actually ask them identify your core values, but talk about a conflict and how you would reconcile that. Because in real life, we go around every day. We can't always walk away from the situation. We have to figure out how do we yeah. reconcile that, that we can live with ourselves. And if you truly can't live with yourself, then then you think about, OK, I'm not in the right place. Mm -hmm. And some people just won't be in the right place. You know, I think exactly. if somebody came up to me directly and simply outside of this setting and said, where are your core values? You know, I think we so to many degrees we try to live them so much that we probably don't think what they are. I mean, we, we, right. have, we have a hard time phrasing what those core values are. It doesn't, doesn't mean we don't have them, but it's, it's right. just part of our persona, I guess. Right, because it's so deeply embedded in yeah. who you are. Yeah, it's interesting, but it's interesting how many people have never actually, so I teach, you know, Merrill Hurst, the average age is, you know, in 30s or lower 40s, have never really stopped to consider. Even think they know how they live mm -hmm. their lives, but and I had this one young woman, and uh, it was one of those stories where she was struggling in work. So she did this exercise where she went through and identified her core values and talked about her conflict, and her conflict was at work. Mm -hmm. And she realized, I mean, it was a little daunting as the professor when she came and she said, I realize I need to quit my job. And I went, Oh my God! Don't do this because I've been trying to do this exercise. But it's on you. You're going to be home now. Talk about burning. My name is due on the fifteenth. But you know, for her, it was this enlightening experience that she actually was able to get at one of the Phil Knight scholarships and go to school full time. She's now in the graduate program. But if she hadn't stopped to do that. She, she admitted, she said, I would probably still be in that position, struggling every day, mm -hmm. being unhappy every day, going to work. Mm -hmm. And so often, so encouraging people to do that, because you're right, so many people just haven't stopped to think about it. We know how we live our lives, but what are the values? Mm -hmm. And all those decisions you make, mm -hmm. they're based on your values. They have to be because we're human, you know, and that's how we make decisions. So, but great, great example. And every city is a little bit different. You know, I've worked in yeah. different cities in different states. This commission makes good decisions based on their core values. Right. They do the right thing for the right reasons almost all the time, and that's why I feel good about right. being in Oregon City. Right. What else is this guy going to say? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I got the job. Right? Yeah, of course, it's, it's all being recorded. <laughs> but it's, Doug said, I, don't, I haven't thought about my core values, but I guarantee you I could sit down and tell Tony what your core values are. I mean, think about that. Because I know, I, he I know what he, he thinks is important. I know what every one of you guys believe is important, right. because I make it my job to listen to that and kind of figure out what are they, what what is important to them. Because you're right, Kathy. The transparency thing is, I have to have that sense of discernment. Of uh, the staff will tell you sometimes they probably get tired of me saying, "We need to tell the commission about this," or "Should we tell the commission <laughs> about that?" It's so much stuff happening every day. It's like, don't overwhelm us. But please tell us the stuff we need to know. Right, right. <laughs> so somebody's got to make that call, and it's not always balance. crystal clear. Right. I would love to know that the, the definition of transparency in some place like Las Vegas is a city council. Look at their sign code. And as we talked about in the yeah. break. And look at Martha's Vineyard. Those two sign codes, the one in Martha's Vineyard, no sign made of anything other than wood, can't be higher than two feet. 
Is it right or wrong? No, but it reflects the values of Martha's Vineyard. Right. You go to Las Vegas and look at their sign code. <laughs> <laughs> reflects their values. Right. And we're somewhere in between those. I think right. more toward right. 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 Yeah. 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 We thought, well, were there ethical issues out of Oregon City that we could use as an example? <laughs> and we were really hard pressed to find them. I mean, we found West Lynn. I knew about the embezzlement issue, but fortunately, we haven't been fraught. We as a we haven't been talking about the school district. Well, that's it's always so much <laughs> <talk. laughs> With leadership, and I think it goes down to, as you said, the ethics of the Job leadership. That but see, that's why we're we're doing this, so we don't have to just react. Right. I, I think these guys have heard me say before, ethics is like doing dishes. You're never done. <laughs> You're never really right. finished. You yeah. just have to clean the dishes that well, day. Well, like we said, it's that continuous process. Yes. I, I'm going to actually use a school district in the West Lynn as, as two, two opposites. So we, we, don't, we can't control what every individual staff member is going to do and so right. forth. Mm -hmm. But West Lynn dropped its capability of evaluating. If the mayor at the time says, we, we don't we don't have to have an auditor. Right. And in that right. period of time, they didn't have an auditor, and that's when the embezzlement occurred. School districts are a very different story. Yeah. I mean, they identified the problems. Right. And, and so just, just because you have a failure, whether it's a person on the council or yeah. some staff person, that doesn't right. really talk about the values of the institution right. itself. Right. Well, and that's why, that's a good point, and that's why we put ethics questions into our hiring process and mm -hmm. try to the best they can still come up with the right answers. Frankly, some of our ethics questions I've noticed have been pretty easy, and some of them have been really difficult. But it's surprising to me as I watch some of the interviews, some people automatically get the right answer, and others go, well, and we're trying to hire people that are hardwired, kind of preordained to be ethical. It doesn't necessarily mean they won't make mistakes. They're going to make mistakes because right. we've got 200 and some people in the organization, right. almost 200 people. We're going to make mistakes. It was, yeah. it, it was uh, Jim Mann's comment there, and it was reflected in something else he was talking to me about when they're going through the interview process for police officers. He says it's very difficult because you've got so many people coming in to the first job and so forth, and they see everything in black and white when they're interviewing him. And he gave a perfect example where no, it's not that black and white, mm -hmm. and and, uh, uh, and you got to build that perception in things aren't black and white. I mean, there are re there are various reasons why people do various things, and right. sometimes even if they're wrong, there's some level of reason why that happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. I was gonna say that I don't, you know, I don't think ethics are just stealing people though, or stealing things. I, I think it's. You know, getting uh, there's places that where you hear about uh, uh, you hear a lot of it in Multnomah County uh, <laughs> sick usage. You know, people calling in sick and stuff like. That. I mean, that's that's a form of theft. That's not stealing, but that's. I mean, that is ethically. Mm -hmm. if, if you're not coming to work when you should, or if you're doing a halfway job on, you know, if I'll just use an officer's explanation. If if they're only doing half the job. If they're, if they're not doing as full of an investigation or as good of an investigation, I, I think loosely that that's et an ethical decision too. You know, somebody's you're getting paid to go meet the public's expectation, and they're not right. just expecting that you're not going to steal. Right. They're expecting that when they call you, when somebody did something to them that may not be that relatively important in the course of what an officer does every day, to that person who called, that's a big, big deal. Sure. And uh, so I think that you know how we all create an environment of ethics plays into that too, not just the, the obvious stuff. Yeah, not the obvious, because you know, it's one thing to, like I use the example of the laptop, it's really egregious, mm -hmm. but you know, misuse of hours, I mean, calling in sick when you're not sick. Using that was me in the fourth grade. Using, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> using, <laughs> <laughs> not surprising. <laughs> using family medical leave. Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't like You know, so I, I know of one organization that has departments where better than 50% of some of these departments, all of their staff were on family medical leaves. They really don't have a good control yeah. over it. And people are using it because for a variety of different reasons that are being allowed, but 
is it really necessary? And somehow that environment is over a time it's gotten okay there. Exactly. It That's becomes right. an acceptable behavior. Organizational right? culture. And it's the organizational mm -hmm. culture that, mm -hmm. well, nobody's going to do anything yeah. about it, so I might as well take advantage. I mean, one of the things we talk about is frontline. Is it okay to do certain things just because everybody else is doing it? Mm -hmm. Does that make it morally right? Well, the answer would be no. But some people will say, well, yeah, why, why can't I? If everybody else is calling in sick on a sunny day, why can't I? They don't do anything about it. So it's like, how do you create the culture that says it's really not acceptable? You have a accountability to each other in that. I, so I just had a question about that today. Um, with the city of Portland, we get two weeks sick leave, but they consider if you use more than sixty percent of your sick leave as abuse. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So if somehow that doesn't settle right. in my mind really well. Right. Or there's other organizations who you have so much sick leave. But if you call in sick more than six days right. out of your ten, uh -huh. you're written up. Yeah, that's what this but is. But it's still your sick time. But is it to hold people accountable? Are you really sick? But yeah, it's, it's yeah. a strange yeah. It goes back to do you create a, an environment of being punitive or an environment where people are going to be more honest and they don't, or what is going on that everybody's calling in sick? Mm -hmm. That's usually what I, or that everybody feels they need to go on medical leave. What's underlying that that might be something you really need to delve into that's, you know, is the I think what moral we want distress is and... We want our folks here to have this organizational commitment that they don't want to do that in the first place. Exactly. You know what I mean? It never even right. occurs to them, hey, I could, I, could fluff, I could fluff up the sick day here and get, get myself a day off, the sun's out. Right. But that means I'm going to dump my stuff on a right. fellow employee or I'm going to disappoint my boss or the organization or right. maybe I just like my work so much that I want to go there and I do my work. work and feel good about myself and be sick when I'm really sick. That's what we're hoping for is that that's, that's the kind of people we want to hire. Exactly. We want to hire for that to you begin with. You want that with. level of commitment, mm -hmm. right? That organizational commitment. So I think it's a se segue. I know we're kind of running low on time, but um, I was just really impressed with I'm new to the organization about a year, and the organization's commitment to ethics, I was impressed with how David presented that in the beginning. Right. And then the fact, I'm watching how everyone is absolutely engaged. Our leadership and our executive staff are all engaged in this training. Everyone is present. I don't think anybody missed today in this class. And everybody's really engaged in the discussion. I was very impressed by that. I think that speaks volumes for the city. I do, too, because everybody wanted to participate. And I tried not to call too many people out. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. So any other closing comments or? Appreciate, just appreciate, uh, you know, coming out here and, and mm -hmm. giving us our, uh, our review on ethics. Absolutely. I think it was great. Well, hopefully it was helpful, as I said, next two days with frontline and managers and then three days next week to cover it. Yeah. So they'll get a slightly different variation, but some of the same, and hopefully a lot of dialogue with them. So, well, thank you. It's always thank great. You. I love thank coming you. to Oregon City, so it's always great. I have family out here, so it's always great to meet you. Thank, thank you. So, yeah, absolutely. And I didn't keep you after. Just a goodbye. Just the, just the